right, here we are again. Everyone had coffee? Everyone have coffee? Caffeination? Very good. Um, thanks all for coming. And I want, again, to express again my gratitude, in fact, I'm sure our collective gratitude, to our speaker of last night, who I thought provided a truly sort of generative kickoff, sort of kick-ass kickoff, if you will, to this day. And I think we'll, I, I more than suspect we're going to be coming back, looping back to Paul's line of thought, his observations repeatedly today. And that's what this event should be about. There's a, sort of one basic ground rule, and that is that the papers not be siloed, but instead that we be webbing things together, bringing in experiences, ideas from other places, uh, that we argue, I love arguing, so that at the end of the day, when we shut down, we'll leave with something that's bigger than the sum of all its individual, and I'm sure, excellent parts. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I really do have a very personal, special interest in what gets said today. Uh, last summer, a few of us went to Tunisia, uh, escorted firmly by Andy and Khorasan, uh, newbies to the region, um, Jen, Steve, me, a few other people. Uh, and after that experience, I for one really want to think very seriously about this state of the field in North African archaeology. What would work? What is needed? New field work, legacy data, emphasis on cultural heritage, what? Uh, so please experts, you tell me. So those are the grand rules. I am now going to introduce uh, Andrew Dufton, who will moderate our first session. Andy. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Um, we're on a tight schedule again. We're just going to get into the papers. As we discussed last night, our first session is on urbanism and urbanization. Um, and I'm moderating it because I hope that will be the discussion in my, in my dissertation. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Joan San Martí of the University of Barcelona. His research focuses on the proto-history of the Western Mediterranean in its broadest sense. He asks questions of the social and economic processes of the state in the pre-Roman period. This has led him to extensive fieldwork in Catalonia, on the Balearic Islands, and for the past decade, at the Tunisian site of Altiboros. I had the good fortune of visiting Altiboros this summer um, while the team was working there, and I can tell you that uh, aside from receiving a delicious snack before we went on our way, um, <laughs> You guys are in for a treat. The site presents a fascinating and complex stratigraphy, and it is pushing our understanding of the city into much earlier periods in this region. Please join me in welcoming Dr. San Marti with his talk, Iron Age Urbanism in New Media. Thank you very much. Despite. It's that pretty, we want to see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I was saying that despite the lack of time, I must necessarily stand you a few seconds to express my gratitude for your kind invitation and for your interest in our work in Tunisia. We all feel really honored to be here today and to hope uh, you will find this contribution of some valuable, of some value for the world. <coughs> I also want to apologize for my extremely rusty English. Uh, I hope you will understand me, but it, it is not granted that I will always understand you if you speak very fast. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your understanding. Well, as you all know, by the late third century, uh, there were two large Median states in North, uh, in North Africa, the Masisilis and the Masilis. You also know that they were ruled by kings and that they preserved strong tribal structures. And you know, there was a consistent number of cities that are mentioned in the written sources regarding the Punic Wars, the Mercenaries War, and the Gothas War. Unfortunately, these sources tell us but very little about these cities' nature and size, except that they were that there were defensive walls as well as palaces in the king's capitals like Certain. Sometimes they are said to be large, but the only more or less precise figure we may use is Diodorus' indication that Hecatompilos, which is thought to be the best, gave 3,000 hostages to Carthage in 247 BC. 
it follows that the city must have been of considerable size. Neither do the ancient sources give any indication about the origins and history of the Numidian states and the Numidian cities. Since the oldest reference to, to them is Diodorus' account of Nakathocles' campaign in the late 4th century BC. <coughs> to date, archaeological research has not provided consistent information that may help us understand this city's nature and dating, but just a few sparse data. We know, for example, that there was some orthogonal town planning in cities like uh, Budaveja and Certa. We also know that some houses at Certa are reminiscent of Punic dwellings, like those excavated at Carthage by Serge de We should add to this the second century Ionian temple that has been recently excavated at Zana, but it remains unpublished. And the well known tower like mausolea at Sika, Thuka, and still other towns. Not really much on the whole. These limited data, in addition, are always dated to the last two centuries of the first millennium BC. As a consequence, virtually nothing is known about the origins and formation processes of the cities, which are closely linked, that goes without saying to the rise of complex societies and state formation. <laughs> Let me add, before going on, that the situation is exactly the same as regards small, smaller towns, villages, and farms. Their existence is mentioned in the ancient sources, especially by Sallust, but they are not archaeologically well attested to date. So, in other words, we know nearly nothing about settlement patterns, nor do we have any significant archaeobiological information about the ancient environment and its exploitation. Clearly, the only possible way to tackle the problem of the formation and nature of these cities and states is through intensive field work combining both survey and excavation with the aim to discover settlement patterns, the relationship between necropolises and settlements, the structure of the settlements, and obviously good stratigraphic sequences that may give us solid data and chronology on the evolution of material culture and technology, as well as archaeobiological archeobio data on the environment. This is what we have been trying to do at, uh, with the Altiboros project the basic aim of which was to retrieve relevant information to explain the formation processes of the Numidian states. The results are interesting, yet, and inevitably, still very limited. Othiboros is a rather small and rather obscure town, some 30 kilometers south of Sica Veneria, on the northern edge of the Elksur Massif. The project started in 2006, and after nine seasons, we, it has achieved some important results, which are hopefully just the beginning of still more intensive work. The city centre was excavated by French archaeologists <coughs> in the early 20th century, but only to the Roman or late antique levels, as usual, I should yeah. add. In accordance with the aims of our project, it seemed advisable to adopt a comprehensive strategy in order to obtain diachronic data on the issues I just mentioned, in particular on those that lie at the, heart, at the heart of social change processes such as demography, technology, and urbanization. Such a comprehensive strategy includes both expensive, uh, extensive survey and the excavation of several settlements and cemeteries. Our first contribution was the Urban Field Survey, which indicates the presence of Roman handmade pottery, indicated here by black squares, over an area <coughs> of about seven hectares. This may have been the total issue of the city, the, the total size of the city at some stage, 
but this remains to be proved by more extensive excavation. Our digs have been made in previously excavated areas on both sides of the city's capital, like Zone 1 and Zone 2. These are views of Zone 2 where thick stratigraphic deposits have been excavated, attesting the occupation of this area from the early 1st millennium BC to the Byzantine and even medieval period. These are relevant results, as we can say that we have found the oldest rema uh, settlement remains attested so far in the Eastern Maghreb, and that this sequence indicates cultural and very probably human continuity all along the first millennium BC. On the contrary, the results are a little bit disappointing at this structural level, as it has been, not been possible to understand the settlement structure at any stage of its history, and not even to complete any of the houses ground plan. In fact, we only have fragments that cannot be easily interpreted. <coughs> you see here the oldest remains, dated to the 10th century BC. A little bit more has been attested for the 8th century BC, in particular <coughs> these very thick walls. And still more for the late 7th to 5th century BC, including a Punic type system <coughs> which is clearly reminiscent of those excavated at Carthage by the German mission. The best data, nevertheless, are dated to the 4th to 3rd century BC. They include a consistent part of two or maybe three domestic buildings here, and in particular the remains of a, an impressive defensive wall in zone one that you can be in these pictures here and here. And this is another portion of it we excavated in the last two years. On the contrary, we know very little about the, the subsequent Numidian phases that you can see here in pink color. <coughs> Let us now turn on to the issues like demography, technology, and economy, which are strictly linked to state formation. What we can say at the present stage is that iron technology was known in the 8th and probably the 9th century BC, but we do not know what it was used for, particularly it was, if it was used for making tools, which would be particularly interesting. We do also have very good archaeobiological information. I draw your attention to the presence of uh, Vanguard. That indicates the existence of a fully sedentary population from the very beginning, as proved by the importance of vineyard cultivation and from the 8th century of olive trees. Faunal data attest an interesting evolution indicating a strong decrease of bulls in the first centuries of the first millennium BC, while pigs, sheep, and goat increase at the same time. We think this is an indication of population growth, which would have caused the spread of crops <coughs> and, and the consequent pastures decline. This would imply an increase in species that can be fed in dry environments or with the remains of human foodstuffs, like pigs. It is also worth noting that our digs have provided, provided a very good amount of information to start building the history of Numidian material culture in the first millennium BC. Not only for pottery, in whose knowledge we have consistently advanced, but also for other kinds of items that were previously very poorly known or simply unknown. In addition to very valuable information on trade from the 8th to the 1st century BC. Regarding the peri urban settlement patterns, our survey of Altiboros Valley has revealed the existence of at least five small sites indicated here in, with brown areas 
where we have collected pre-Roman handmade pottery. But all of them were subsequently occupied until at least the late antique times. We also discovered that there was an extensive megalithic necropolis indicated here by the Blue Dutch, and this is just a small portion of it. In fact, uh, these megalithic necropolises are typical of the Eastern Numidian area, but have not been studied in depth so far. In 2014, we have completed the survey of the El Sur Massif Necropolis, which contains more than 1,000 structures, forming a well-defined cluster that you can see here, which we think is connected with Altiboros, more precisely. We believe that this necropolis is an extensive tribal cemetery and that the city of Altiboros is the center of this tribe. <coughs> Most of the tombs are dolmen like monuments, mostly round, like, the, like those, sometimes square, like this one, though some other types are also uh, present. I do not have time to expand on this uh, issue. Just let me say that we have been able to excavate three of these dolmen-like structures. They are dated to the mid-first millennium BC, except in one case, which could be uh, a little later. Two of them are small, like the one you're seeing here, Monument 197. But Monument 53 is much larger, and much more complex from several points of view, attesting the existence of some social complexity by the mid first, uh, first millennium BC. This is another view of it. Finally, I would like to mention the Schwelberg Monument, which we have been excavating from uh, 2013. It is placed uh, on top of a high hill with impressive views on the surrounding plains, as you can see here, which is exactly the same location than the so-called Numidian monument at Simitha Shemtu, which is very spoiled, but whose reconstruction may be admired at the Shemtu Museum with a typical Hellenistic uh, decoration of trophies in both shields and arms. <coughs> it is dated to the second half of the second century BC <coughs> and constitutes a magnificent, magnificent example of power display by the Numidian monarchy. Well, our monument belongs to the same type and like the one at Chempio has been thoroughly uh, spoiled. In spite of these, several sculpted blocks have been recovered, like uh, this armor, one shield, <coughs> another shield, and an armor on the left. You can see here the spoiled trenches in this uh, orthograph uh, uh, picture. And this is what has been left of it. These are the sculptured fragments you have seen before. And uh, this is a view of the excavation. This is uh, the rest, uh, what, 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 what is preserved of the podium. And it's uh, uh, extremely spoiled, but nevertheless a very interesting monument to understand uh, the power display of the Numidian monarchy. Well, I would like to conclude with some important remarks. Firstly, that the available data are consistent with our model of social change that considers the demographic growth as the key factor, while admitting that technological change and uh, colonial contacts may also have uh, had a relevant role. Secondly, I would like to stress that we need to fill another gap. We have filled mm -hmm. the first millennium BC gap, but we still have the second millennium BC gap. We cannot understand what's going on in the first millennium without understanding what was there before. But we have no course as to how to do this at present. The third 
important remark is that however poor our data are in the present state of research, the available uh, information suggests that the organization and state formation were quite on the move by the mid-first millennium, and still more so on the, in the fourth uh, century BC, as attested by the building of the, the wall you have seen before. And finally, I need to stress the, needs, the need of continuity. At Altiguros itself, certainly, with excavation of new areas, and new tombs, and uh, pushing up a, a survey, but elsewhere as well. Altiguros is just a small spot in this immense uh, North African area. So uh, new projects would be welcome, especially there were settlements without later occupation, I mean without Roman and uh, late antique occupation, may be attested. If they can be identified, which is not quite, uh, quite evident to me. Well, this was all. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening to this presentation. Resources, and there's some information about them available in the lobby. Um, the Society for Libyan Studies, I'm sure, would be pleased to have, to have somebody who picked them up. Good books. Um, and it's working as the, the Libyan Sahara that will be talking to us about today um, with his talk on Saharan urbanism in the Gary Mantian state. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Mattingly. Well, thank you for the welcome, and uh, particularly thank you for the invitation. I think this is the third time I've been invited to something at Brown, and I finally made it. Uh, and great, great, great to be here. Um, I'm going to stray a little bit beyond Saharan urbanism, uh, and indeed I, I want to pick up on some things uh, that Juan Samati has, has presented so brilliantly, because uh, I think our two papers actually run together, and they point very much in the same direction. Uh, we are fellow travellers in this sense. So my paper seeks to draw out further the implications of uh, Juan Samati's presentation on early Numidian urbanism and my own work on the Garamantian civilization in the central Sahara for the study of Roman Africa. Specifically, I'm going to question some underlying assumptions of this study, first promoted in the classical sources, but reinforced in the modern colonial era. These assumptions relate to the processes of urbanization and the development of agriculture in the Maghreb and the identity of the communities behind these innovations. The common tendency has been to link these crucial social changes to, time, to a time after the arrival of colonists on African shores, whether Greek, Phoenician, or Roman. The role of native African peoples has generally been limited to that of passive recipients or inexpert imitators. The new evidence on the date of the earliest agriculture and the early stages of proto-urban development pose fundamental questions for these traditional models. The story of Roman Africa is often constructed around two extraordinary epiphenomena of the era. The first defining characteristic is presented as an unusually high density and magnificence of towns in the region during the Roman period. Second, there was an evident boom in the agricultural output with concurrent distribution of the surplus production across Mediterranean markets. Now, I'm not challenging the fundamental significance of these themes for our, a study of Roman Africa, but rather I'm questioning the orthodox position on what the drivers of these phenomena were. The scholarly consensus view of Africa and the Roman Empire has been skewed by the agenda of modern colonialism in the region. The modern imperial regimes in North Africa were fixated on a Romano-centric vision, with a particular emphasis on the notion of Romanization and the modern colonial ventures as successors to the ancient, claiming to reprise a previous attempt at European civilization of Africa, based around the gifts of agriculture and urban, urbanization. So my main argument here is that we have still not deconstructed the primary tenets of the old colonial models, and that the future agenda of, stu of our study remains compromised. A variant of the emphasis on the Roman inspiration of agrarian and urban development concerns the role of Phoenicians and or Carthaginians in kick-starting these processes. And both these scholarly tendencies present a paternalistic view of external civilizations bringing advanced skills and <coughs> institutions for the instruction of backward and passive indigenous populations. 
the Libby Phoenician cities along the uh, African coast are thus often hailed as key players in the introduction of cultivation and urban living. In Cyrenaica, eastern Libya, Greek colonists stand in for Phoenicians in the identical scenario. The classic characterization of indigenous Africans at the same time has been that they were simple pastoralists who lacked substantial sedentary settlements <coughs> and farming uh, before colonists first visited African shores. So in a nutshell, my question concerns whether the Romans and earlier incomers to the Maghreb were ultimately responsible for the dramatic changes we witness in farming and town life, and that undoubtedly represented an urban and agrarian boom by the heyday of Roman Africa. So was it outsiders who shaped Africa, or did indigenous groups have a larger role in the process than uh, generally credited? The problem in seeking to resolve this question is that the archaeological evidence is drastically unequal. As we've seen, far more excavation has taken place of those upper Roman levels of sites than of the proto-historic uh, African societies in the Maghreb and Sahara. At Roman cities, the presence of major monuments impedes exploration of the earliest levels of occupation, leaving unchallenged, till now, the assumptions about their origins. So what sort of societies were the indigenous African communities of the first millennium BC? The default assumption, both in antiquity and today, as I've mentioned, has tended to be that they were small-scale tribes of pastoralists and that most of the vast hinterland was still essentially underdeveloped prior to the arrival of Rome. So let me start with urbanization first. Towns were certainly a characteristic, even defining feature of the African provinces of the Roman Empire. However, we're perhaps over-familiar with a series of extraordinary examples of monuments and cities. And these 15 or 20 sites uh, continually dominate the visual record of towns in Roman Africa. If you look at the books, the textbooks, it's the same 10 or 15 sites that come again and again. And the question is, are these actually typical of the, 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 the hundreds of urban sites? So they, the, this visual record dominates our mental map of Roman urbanism in, in Africa. Now, this map gives an approximation of urban densities in the Roman Empire. What's immediately apparent is that Africa Consularis was the main focus for high-density development in the Maghreb. So densely packed were towns in northern Tunisia, for instance, that it's been estimated that the average territory of a city was only in the order of 80 square kilometers. Though some other parts of the Maghreb, as we can see, and the Libyan coast had much lower levels of urbanization. It's also evident that Africa was one of seven main urban hotspots in the Roman Empire, the others being Italy, Greece, Asia Minor, the Levant, the Nile Delta, and southwestern Spain. And what those other areas share in common is the fact that Roman urbanism there built on already well-established urban traditions. If we compare the success of Roman urbanism in regions of low pre-Roman urban urbanism and proto-urbanism like northern Gaul and Britain, the difference in numbers, density and status promotions of towns is very striking. This comparative view might thus suggest that the high urban density in Africa is most readily explicable in terms of pre-Roman developments. So most modern commentators would accept that the Roman urban achievement didn't happen ex nihilo, but represented rather a rapid growth in urban centers and in the size, monumentality, and status of many of these. The urban progenitors, however, have mostly been identified with Carthage or the Libby Phoenician centers without consideration, full consideration of alternatives. But can the pre-Roman development of, uh, be attributed solely to Phoenician and Carthaginian inspiration? Even where a potential African urban community is recognized, the impetus for growth is often vested in newcomers, uh, Roman citizens, for instance. Carthage was clearly an extraordinary urban center, but it was also unique in Africa for the, its scale and development in the first millennium BC. In general, Punic specialists have found it difficult to match literary dates for the foundations of, of cities with archaeological evidence. At present, the archaeological traces from Carthage date to the 8th century BC compared with a literary date to the 9th century. Similar things, Adutica, which is uh, in the literary sources even earlier. Furthermore, for, for, other, for other Libby Phoenician emporia, at present, the evidence suggests that the main expansion of their numbers came after 500 BC. 
the best preserved Punic town at Kirkwan, with its main phase of structural development in the 4th to 3rd centuries BC, is atypical because of its abandonment by around 200 BC. On the other hand, the extensive excavations there have revealed this site to have been a small-scale settlement lacking in public buildings and monumental architecture. It was little more than a large village, and evidence for the spatial extent of other emporia also suggests that these were generally quite small in size uh, in the first millennium BC. It's certainly the case that many of these Libby Phoenician urban centres did develop into much more extensive cities during the Roman period, as at Leptiminus. The investigation of early Libby Phoenician urbanism has thus far not fully matched expectations then, <coughs> albeit with the extraordinary exception of Carthage. Nor did these coastal settlements provide the only model and inspiration for the emergence of towns in the hinterland. As Juan Samarti and Nabil Kalala's work at Alphabus has dramatically uh, illustrated, our perceptions need to change. Uh, they've considerably backdated the emergence of indigenous proto-urban settlement in Tunisia. So the urban model that's presented at such sites was in all probability distinctive and unlike the Phoenician and Roman uh, traditions. My slide here shows three small Numidian towns that all occupied narrow promontories defined by steeply incised wadi channels, Medidi, Bagat, and Althaburus. Roman Althaburus eventually spilled out across a larger area, but the early settlement appears to have been concentrated on a narrow promontory, about 500 by 120 metres, or 6 hectares, in area. The characteristic elements of all three sites here is the relatively small size, 5 to 8 hectares in general, and the location on a narrow defensible spur, with dry streams constituting a substantial moat around much of the perimeter. Bagat Hentia Gayada near Zama, Regia, is another good example of this type. The wall site, 8 hectares only, sits on a defensible spur of land between two converging wadis. It contains limited traces of monumental construction around a central rectangular space, perhaps a forum, and probably the locality of a known temple of Tellus. The urban core is surrounded by an extensive set of cemeteries covering at least 25 hectares and incorporating pre-Roman style megaliths and Bazina monuments. There is a suburban sanctuary of Balhamon, later elaborated as a temple of Saturn here, and Saturn stele were also recovered in relation to one of the northern cemeteries. In late Roman times, Bagat appears to have been the seat of a bishopric. Survey at the site has turned up Libyan, Neopunic and Latin inscriptions reflecting the diverse cultural identities at play. And Medidi is another example of this same sort of setting. And although the Roman town here again eventually spread across around 30 hectares, the original Numidian core almost certainly lay within the 5 hectare area on the top of the prominent plateau between the wadis once again. Here again, there is a megalith cemetery to the south, the site and numerous stele of Balhamon and Saturn, including 18 new Punic texts. Now, all these sites seem to represent an urban tradition that initially had evolved independent of those external influences. Most studies of towns in Roman Africa have focused on the Roman and the monumental characteristics of these sites, ignoring or downplaying features that don't conform to our expectations of the classical city. Uh, and it's interesting that all of these uh, cities have a rather irregular uh, street grid, for instance. Unusual sites like Tidis in Algeria, heavily terraced into a precipitous uh, site with, a, with few of the standard amenities of a Roman town, are pigeonholed as exceptions to a Romanized norm. But my suspicion is that uh, these types of fortified promontories and fortified hill sites uh, were much more common. Uh, in, in the interior of North, North Africa uh, and uh, were the essential form of these pre-Roman uh, uh, sites in, in the hinterland. So my conclusion uh, is that Roman Africa was full of towns precisely because nucleated settlements had a very long prior tradition here. The hundreds of Roman towns were literally built on hundreds of indigenous villages and proto-urban settlements. And you know, we should expect the traces of those to come through in the archaeological record of those superimposed Roman sites. In Punic and Roman times, we certainly witnessed contact and adaptive change, but the African fundamentals of towns have hitherto been unexamined. <laughs> right, time to get to the Garamantes. <laughs> <laughs> my main archaeological case study concerns my own field work in uh, the central Sahara of southern Libya. A Libyan people known from the time of Herodotus as the Garamantes lived here, in a zone that was already hyper-arid desert before the first millennium BC. The Garamantes can be associated with three major bands of oases 
in the center of Sahara, with smaller isolated clusters to southwest, southeast, and northeast. The central band, the Wadi al Ajal, and the southern bands, the Mazuk Basin, are comprised the heartland territory and will be the main focus of attention here. The density of nucleated settlements in this part of the central Sahara was totally unsuspected prior to my recent work, and though many Garamantian sites cannot be closely dated, it is apparent that the evolution of this settlement system began about 1000 BC. Um, and on the map there, we've got a, a map showing um, literally hundreds of Garamantian village type settlements uh, across um, just the parts of the landscape we've looked at intensively uh, so far. So despite a hostile hyper-arid desert environment following major climatic change around 5,000 years ago, it's now clear that like the, the Numidians, the Garamantes were largely sedentary people by the early first millennium BC, living in permanent and well-defended settlements. By 400 BC or thereabouts, these early Garamantian settlements, of which the classic example is a hill fort known as the Nkekra, were taking on an increasingly proto-urban form. Through time, the morphology of the best preserved Garamantian sites became increasingly sophisticated, and by late antiquity, showing some influence of Roman frontier settlements far to the north. <coughs> However, the underlying evolution of the nucleated centers extends far back before the contact period. Jarma, the Garamantian capital, was one such site, though the Garamantian levels are here overlain by the ruins of a sequence of later towns. There were ten phases of construction recognized, with the earliest levels dating back to the 4th century BC. As at Althaburus, the use of AMS dating and detailed study of material culture and paleoeconomic markers have transformed our understanding of the origins and economy of the site. Jarma may have been a site of exceptional importance, but other Garamantian settlements of the Classic period are also notable for their architectural uh, sophistication, their semi-planned nature, their density in the landscape, and their scale. The larger sites are urban in scale and in functional characteristics. And what's become increasingly apparent in the last few years is that the settlement system merits the appellation urban from the latter centuries BC onwards, prior to contact with Rome. And the dense nexus of uh, permanently settled villages doesn't conform at all to the testimony of the ancient sources, which tended to depict the Garamantes as barbaric nomads. Moreover, the density and sophistication of Oasis settlements in the Garamantian territory raise question marks about the presumed start-up date of other Saharan oases. The map here highlights some of the main groups in southern Tunisia, where the origin can be traced back to the Roman era at least. Since the dating of these sites is largely dependent on diagnostic material culture, this is more likely a question of visibility rather than actual foundation dates. These oases occur in many areas occupied by the people defined by the ancient sources as Gaituli, who are widely represented by modern scholars as ex exclusively uh, nomadic. The evidence relating to the Garamantes can thus be supplemented with other examples that support the idea of more generalized independent ur urban evolution in, in the Sahara, predating Phoenician and Roman contacts uh, uh, with and interventions in these societies. Well, I'm going to finish quickly uh, by just uh, referring to what, what, I th what I'm thinking of as pathways to ur urbanism in North Africa. So uh, those yellow symbols indicating that, that those coastal Libby Phoenician, uh, a coastal Libby Phoenician tradition of urbanization, we've got uh, a small smattering of red symbols, probably many, many more examples could be put on there, representing an inland Numidian uh, tradition. Um, but increasingly now also we can add uh, a large number of oasis settlements uh, attested by different forms of evidence uh, to at least exist in the Roman period. And I want to finish with a couple of models which seem to have disappeared uh, from my presentation. So I'll, uh, I'll finish there. <laughs> we can discuss the models later. <laughs> Luckily, we have a 30-minute discussion plan towards the end of this session where we can yeah, dig out the models. Um, <laughs> what do you think of? So our final speaker in the first session on urbanism and urbanization is Dr. Corsand Bennett, who's getting mic'd up as we speak, um, of the University of Leicester. Uh, 
Gorsuch is a familiar face to many of us here at Brown. Um, after completing her degree at Stanford University, uh, she held a one-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Tchaikovsky Institute last year, uh, before taking her current position as a Lieberkuhn Fellow. Her research is a bit of a chronological departure. We've been talking about the early origins of cities, and now we're going to talk about what happens to them after the Romans. You'll notice a conspicuous absence of Roman cities in the session. Uh, <laughs> And her research focuses on Byzantine and Islamic periods and the transition from the classical to the medieval city. Um, I promised her I won't give any anecdotes, even though I've known her for quite a long time. Um, but I'm happy to give you anecdotes at coffee later. Uh, please join me in welcoming Khorasan with her talk, Tales of the City, Archaeology, Urbanization, and the Muslim Conquest. Thank you very much. On the 8th of June, 632, a man called Muhammad died in Medina. Ten years later, his followers raided Byzantine Africa, the first episode in what was to be a long and fraught process of establishing Muslim rule in the Maghreb. It was not until 697 or 8 that Byzantine Carthage finally fell and Africa officially became Ifriqiya. Now this moment, the moment when everything, the moment when North Africa came under Muslim rule, has long been seen as the moment when everything changed for North Africa. And not in a good way. It's a dividing moment in North African history. It's a moment, it's, it's the moment which marks the division between ancient and medieval North Africa, between Christian Roman North Africa and Muslim Arabic speaking North Africa. And as a result, scholarship has often fallen on one side or the other, with the Romans, uh, as you may imagine, winning out. So how have people interpreted the impact of the Muslim conquests? Well, as you might imagine, the traditional tale um, established in the colonial period is one of catastrophe, of urban ruin and collapse, the failure of a settled urban, read civilized society. If we were to visualize it, might look something like this, with people squatting amongst the glorious ruins um, of Roman cities. So it is a tale that has its roots in colonial discourse, a tale that is deeply problematic for many reasons, but not least because the city has often been taken as the barometer of civilization, the benchmark of political and economic complexity, the way of gauging how strong and successful the Muslim caliphate and the later Muslim successor states were. Nonetheless, it's an enduring narrative that, despite the very best efforts of, of several scholars, including archaeologists, has proved very difficult to counter. The first reason for this are the types of sites that archaeologists have looked at, David's usual suspects. The evidence we have does not come from the cities that were most successful in the medieval period, many of which are still occupied today. The evidence we have comes from towns that prospered in the Roman period, but failed at some point in the Middle Ages and were abandoned. Now, as archaeologists, this is great, you know, we love abandoned sites. They're easier to dig. And in North Africa, they are extremely impressive. A site like Timgad, the Pompeii of North Africa, can make even the most jaded of, of archaeologists gasp. But when it comes to understanding urbanism in the medieval period, the Roman ruins of these sites have exerted a powerful and, and dangerous influence. Focusing on cities that, like this that ultimately failed has created a skewed understanding of urban dynamics. It's like trying to understand American cities in the 20th century by looking only at the abandoned gold rush towns in California and ignoring the San Francisco's of this world. You look at the ruined streets and temples and churches of the Timgad, a site that failed in the medieval period, and it is hard not to see urban crisis. But towns like Timgad are not the whole story. The allure of the Roman ruins has had a second unfortunate effect. The sites that we know best were stripped down to their early Roman levels, often without recording later occupation. So take the theatre at Leptis Magna, for example. A stunning example, to be sure. But would you believe that we know nothing more than the plan of the huge housing and productive complexes that were built over it at some point in the late antique or medieval period. In the absence of excavation reports, we simply 
don't know when. Now, evidence is a real issue in this period. A lot, as, as I said, there's, we don't know much about the later layers, but there are other issues. We, we, we find it very difficult to identify uh, 8th century occupation. We don't know the ceramic record. Another issue is that very few sites, or the medieval layers of, of, of sites, have, have rarely been published. So even today, there's maybe two or three books, um, Lisa's book on Setif, David's recent publication on Germa, that actually publish all the data we have from the medieval period, including ceramics and zooarchaeological data. So, you know, we are at early days still. Big issues with the evidence. It's slim, it's difficult to interpret, and that makes it controversial. So you can appreciate why it has been difficult to write or rewrite histories of the early medieval city. But I want to suggest that we can do better than we have if we change our tack. If we stop looking at the fate of individual cities and instead zoom out to the regional level and examine what wider patterns can or cannot be extrapolated from the data. In short, I hope to convince you today that by looking at the towns that succeeded, uh, rather than simply those that failed, we see a new tale of medieval urbanism. And in fact, this is, this is a tale I think that fits a little better with the Muslim sources that we have, which describe North Africa as a land of prosperous town and cities, the most urbanized region of the Islamic world. So first, if we draw together evidence at the regional scale, it's clear that urban patterns did change substantially in the medieval period. On the eve of the conquest, North Africa was one of the most highly urbanized regions in the Mediterranean. Look at this heat map of late antique towns. It's a densely urbanized landscape with particular concentrations in northern Tunisia and Numidia. Oh, it's doing autumn. Now look at um, this map of 9th century Africa. 200 yeah. years later, we see a radically different landscape. Not only are there less towns than before, but the distribution is very different. Towns are spread out relatively regularly through the region. So I'm not challenging the fact that some towns did fail, but I do think that this transformation demands explanation. Why did some towns thrive and others fail in the early Islamic period? What were the drivers of urban success in the early Middle Ages? Now, these are difficult questions, but I think we need to try and answer them. So the first thing to note is that the Muslims only founded two new cities in the first 150 years of their rule. Kairouan and Tunis, Tunis replacing Carthage, the former Byzantine capital, a city that was famously destroyed. Now, these new towns succeeded. They became some of the most important centres in North Africa. But, and this is important, the majority of medieval cities were those inherited from the Byzantines. Now, are there any common characteristics in those towns that survived? Well, first and perhaps most obvious is location. Look at the map. You see inland, the medieval towns are situated on the main inland or coastal, or the main inland co land routes, linking Tunis and Kairouan um, with the Ores and Sahara. On the coast, the sites that continue are sites like Bizert or Sousse or Sfax, with naturally deep harbours which continue to be used today. The second factor is size and demographic population. The cities that prospered in the medieval period were the largest in the Roman period. Look more closely at the map. It's based on, on Andrew Wilson's estimates of population size for Roman cities. And what's striking is the, is the almost 100% survival rate of the biggest Roman cities into the medieval period. Now, as you would expect, these cities have all the monumental architecture that you would think, temples, theatres, triumphal arches. And in late antiquity, they were also important sites. They gained churches and they become bishoprics. Now, the third significant factor is the presence of an Arab garrison. This map shows that most of the towns that survive have Byzantine-built fortresses or town walls. Now, it makes sense that these towns were fortified in the Byzantine period. As I've suggested, they were the largest, the most populous, most strategically located. Now, the documentary sources confirm that the Arab junt occupied um, the thought, forts left behind by the defeated Byzantines. Now, so few forts have been properly excavated that it's difficult to see this archaeologically, but later repairs and the presence of mosques in a few forts are telling. The growing dominance of these big, well-connected, fortified towns with Arab garrisons comes at the expense of smaller towns particularly those in northern Tunisia, which, as you saw, was, was, particular, was a particular hotspot 
of urbanisation. These small towns were particularly, were simply more vulnerable in the Middle Ages. Many did continue to function on some scale, but ultimately were abandoned or reduced to villages. So at Musti, for example, there is, you can see here, a deep layer of colluvium between the late antique layers and a later medieval reoccupation. So within two centuries then, the urban landscape of North Africa had changed from that to this. But not because towns were destroyed by marauding Arabs or Berbers, not because of societal collapse, but in large part, I, I argue, due to a reorientation of the political and economic dynamics of the region that benefited the large centres hosting the garrisons of, of the Arab junt. These towns were the winners. Now, this did not just happen um, incidentally. If the early Muslim state in North Africa was not particularly interventionist, it did not found lots of cities, it did not destroy lots of cities, it did not displace populations. It was intrusive. It was a military occupation. And it's this, the presence of the junt in most of the towns, that I think has important implications for understanding the dynamics of urbanisation in this period. Hugh Kennedy has recently argued that the presence of Muslim troops in the Islamic East were a catalyst for economic demand and urban growth. He's shown that the Muslim armies did not live off the land, they were paid in cash salaries. This resulted in a massive amount of cash being put into circulation in the places in which they were stationed. As a result, towns with garrisons became centres of economic activities as merchants and people moved there to provide the soldiers with the goods and surface services that they wanted. I think that, that Hugh's model for the Islamic East works in North Africa too. But this is something that, that should have archaeological correlates. It should be possible to see some of these things on the ground. Now obviously, Cairo and Tunis are in some ways the best example of this phenomenon. These are cities created more or less from nothing. We don't know much about their archaeology, but we know from the sources that they quickly became the biggest and most cosmopolitan cities in Ifriqiya, famous for their souks and markets. But we do have some other concrete examples for the 8th century. I'll mention just one, that's already come up. I'll mention just one. The excavations of Lisa and others at the site of Walila, Roman Volubilis in Morocco, is a great example of how the presence of, of soldiers could generate urban growth and development. Long before the Muslim armies reached Morocco, the city, um, I can't see what it's doing. Has it gone blue? Green box. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you're blue. Okay, great. The city was restricted. Do you want the, you want the green box? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> the city was restricted to the western third of the original Roman settlement. A new quarter was established outside the walls under the Umayyads or Abbasids, and subsequently another quarter was established under the Idrisids, possibly, as Lisa argues, um, as the administrative complex of Idris I. Now, huge numbers of Islamic coins have been found both in the extramural settlements and in the old city which reflect its newfound role as an economic hub and its connections with the wider Mediterranean. And this contrasts dramatically with the very, very few finds from the 4th um, to 7th century at the site. Lisa's work has also shown that there is a big distinction between the types of goods that those living in the new Idrisid quarter have, as opposed to those living in the old town. Those in the Idrisid quarter have, they have access to goods imported from elsewhere. They have more coins um, and things like that. So there's, a little, there's an economic division between these two settlements. Volubilis is, in, in many ways, the model example of how soldiers and administrators could contribute to the success and failure of a town. The city developed, expanded, and prospered when it was the seat of a garrison or the capital of a new state. Conversely, its fortunes rapidly deteriorated when the capital was moved to Fez, a new foundation. And within a century, the town was more or less abandoned. Now, Volubilis is, is one of the cities that has been satisfactory dug. It is really the, our best, maybe only, <laughs> um, securely dated, sec properly dug site that, for the 8th century. But can we say anything more about the consequences of, of, this, of this urban network of fewer cities in North Africa? It's a tricky question. Like I said at the beginning, we have, you know, little archaeology has been conducted at those towns 
that succeeded. But I want to propose very briefly that although there are fewer towns, these are often bigger than before. And then the increased demand that these new larger towns placed on North Africa can be seen archaeologically in a number of ways. So first, it's clear that by the 9th century, many towns that succeeded were getting bigger. We saw that Volubilis grew by the foundation of the extramural settlements. The same happens um, at Pomeria Agadir and Hentia El Foa as early as the 8th century. In other cases, like Satif, urban expansion occurs a little later in the 9th and 10th centuries. At the same time, the opening up and, and state investment in long-distance exchange networks encouraged the growth of workshops and productive activities in towns. And from the late 8th century onwards, we see new industrial quarters appearing in towns like at Volubilis, Leptis, Basra, quite often over the remains of earlier Roman structures. The dynamism of the economy also acted as a stimulus for local craft traditions. New formal and ornamental repertoires emerged with new motifs as well as new techniques influenced by the contacts with the broader Islamicate world. Towards the end of the 8th century and picking up uh, with the establishment of the Aglubid successor state um, in after 800, we begin to see a huge amount of investment in monumental architecture, particularly in mosques and fortifications. Now, construction on this scale requires materials on a huge scale, and this is something which hasn't really been looked into. But by the end of the 8th century, we start to see systematic spoliation of abandoned Roman buildings to provide material for state-sponsored rabats and mosques. We have, for example, in the Great Mosque of Cairo, on Byzantine capitals from churches, one of the columns of which has a little inscription saying, for the mosque. To give you some sense of the scale of, of this industry, the excavations at the Church of Birfatur by Susan Stevens found no complete architectural elements in situ anywhere. Even the marble tiles had been lifted from the floors. Now, it's not simply reuse that's going on, you know, a phenomenon that, that in the medieval period has often been used to argue that, that for a lack of complexity, for a lack of being able to work materials. We also see in this period that urban demand for building materials required quarries to be reopened such as this one on the small island just off Monastir's coast, which was reopened to provide blocks for the rabats there and elsewhere. We've also, or also recently, a number of brick kilns have been found inland in, you know, in central Tunisia, which would have been used to produce bricks on a large scale to build these mosques um, and fortifications. There's one more thing that we can, we can look at. Obviously, larger towns require a large agricultural base to support their inhabitants. And the final trend I want to draw attention to is, is a surge of rural settlement in this period. Survey evidence from Gerba, for example, shows that site numbers almost double in the early medieval period. And we see the emergence of new small farms as well as larger farm complexes, speaking to a rise in agricultural production presumably at least in part, catering to this increased demand um, of the towns. I'd like to suggest that the re-establishment of small villages at some of the abandoned towns in the Tunisian Tell is part of the same pattern. Newer villages appear at Utica and Shemtu, for example, in the 9th and 10th century over substantial abandonment layers. At Carthage too, the one city destroyed um, by the Arabs, its vast walled area is splintered into small villages, centred around a larger settlement on the Bursa Hill. Even outside the walls, new small farming communities, one with a small mosque, emerge in the 9th century around the old, now destroyed, basilicas of St. Monique Bifatu and perhaps the Basilica of Maiorum. So to wrap up, I return to where I began. By the 9th century, the urban landscape of North Africa is dominated by large towns, which are both the main hub of regional exchange and a catalyst of demand. These trends accelerate in the 9th and 10th century, with many cities growing even bigger, and a concomitant expansion of industrial and agricultural production and so on. Sometimes less is more, 
and that is certainly true of medieval North Africa. Now, I haven't talked so much about the state, although it's been implicit, and one of the big questions that remains is, is this veritable sort of boom in the 9th and 10th centuries related to the collapse of Abbasid, the rule of the Caliphate, and the establishment of local successor states, like the Aglubids, who invested more heavily in cities and regional infrastructure? Perhaps, although what data we do have does suggest that these trends start bef- you know, in the late 8th century, so before the Aglubids come into power. We do need far more work done to refine the chronologies of these changes. But in the meantime, I hope that I've illustrated that the archaeological material, although it's incomplete, ambiguous, it can be tapped to provide new evidence for the charged debates about urbanism and urbanisation in the earlier Middle Ages. By exploring regional trends, not simply individual sites, by looking at towns that succeeded, not simply those that failed, By trying to look in short at the medieval period on its own terms, not through Roman eyes, I hope that I've convinced you of the need for a new model of the medieval city in North Africa. There's obviously much to be done. Just imagine what tales I could tell you of the medieval city of life after the Muslim conquest with just a little bit more data. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Corey, and thank you again to, to all of our speakers from this session, which I think has given us a lot to discuss. Lights, um, lights up, yes, and we'll discuss it in, in full light. Um, so with that, we'll move on to sort of a general discussion. We'd like to open the floor to everyone. These topics or questions can be related to specific, specific things that have been brought up in the talks that we've heard, or more general observations about things cutting across all three of these talks, or where, where we could be going from here in order to, I mean, to learn more, to answer Corey's questions, to answer David's questions, to answer Joanne's questions, to answer my questions. Um, anyone have any questions? <laughs> I have those, but I, we'll, we'll open it up first. Yeah, Sam. I work for Corey, actually. Um, so we come up to the front? Uh-uh. Yeah, actually, we want to. Loiter. Loiter. Yeah. Loiter. Yeah, loiter behind me. It's sort of intimidating. So I find it really convincing the argument that sort of the, the having the military paid mostly in cash would be then a huge, you know, economic impetus for have these large, you know, more dispersed settlements. So I find that very convincing. But I also wonder if there are implications for that then, for the for the previous administration in the towns that failed. So does that mean? And I know that that you're trying to shift it away from that. So by me asking a question, that's probably you know, a little frustrating, but bear with me for a sec. Um, so the, if the towns that failed, is it because that people are flocking to the new economic opportunities and these more dispersed settlements? Or is it because the previous administration had to invest so much to keep those towns afloat that it was no longer possible when there was not sort of that, you know, statewide and, or military, you know, <coughs> economic investment? That's a very good question. I think, oh, Obviously, this is why we need to, to understand the chronology of these changes a bit better, because we don't know when these smaller towns sort of fell off the map. Certainly by the 7th century, so before the Muslim conquest, they were already struggling. Um, so, you know, and it seems likely since, the, like as I suggested, these are the biggest towns that survived. These are the towns that got the fortifications in the Byzantine period. It may well be that some of these shifts had already started to happen well before the Muslim conquest. So, yeah. For Corey. It seems that the three talks are um, are arguing against historical and literary narratives that that are ultimately based on you know, on Greek and Roman sources. Uh, in the case of of Joanne and, and of David, there is no sort of North African account of what it was like at the time that they're working. But in your case, there is. So, is the Muslim account of the period you're studying? Also, sort of in, also describes the moment as a moment of collapse and failure, or is it, or is it, or is the, or is that sort of native account completely different? No. Well, I did sort of uh, touch on this. Um, so obviously, the the sources we have are written later, so they're not that we don't have any contemporary Arabic sources for the conquest period. The sources that we have are chron- chronicles of the conquests and then later geographies written in the ninth or tenth century, normally written by people at this point. Um, f- not from North Africa. 
Now these, I mean, these, they, they, they give a very different tale. They do not talk about um, destruction um, or abandonment. I mean, obviously, in some towns, they mention it, the ruins of Carthage are very, very famous for it, and people would sort of almost make pilgrimages to them. But the picture we get from the Muslim sources is of a, is of a, a region full of cities, the most, like I said, the most densely urbanized region in the Islamic world. There's, for example, al Muqdasi writing in the 10th century. He, he, he wasn't that keen on the North African peoples. He thought they were rude and boorish and, you know, not up to much, but he did say this is the region with the most cities and these cities are splendid, you know, the like of which is, is comparable to, to some of the most famous cities in, in the Middle East. There's two comments. I think that uh, I would add one element to your discussion, Corey, in suggesting that we really have to face into the fact that what we're dealing with in Africa in the Roman period is a very substantial imperial tribute economy. And it's focusing its production and exploitation on sort of maximizing investment in sort of what you might say marginal agricultural goods in the sense of, it. I mean, these, these areas are great for all of the production, but they have to be maintained and they have to have a sort of large market economy to drive that production forward. And so one of the changes you could add to your list is that I think in many ways after the fourth century, this is a, a tribute economy that's clearly contracting and with it, a lot of the urban-based development that grew out of these things, and that uh, we just have to face into the fact that what you could argue for is that the Roman period is an artificial, you know, push-up of sort of certain types of artificial development that really is related to a very massive tribute economy, you know, Mediterranean-based. And uh, so, what you're returning to may be a more, you know, normal model for urbanization that may not be unlike the Numidian period in some ways. I don't know what, what quick thoughts on that. I think, I think certainly the, the drop-off in the fourth century is that in some ways I'm, I'm almost tempted to say that that what we see in certainly by the ninth and tenth century is a huge investment in the market economy. I mean there's lots and lots of so yeah. lots and lots of new stuff, lots of stuff being being traded. We don't understand this very well but you know even things like Olive groves. There's there's a new um, a rescue excavation at a site called Borjnine, which found a huge olive press dated um, to the ninth century by radiocarbon, and next to it was a huge amphora kiln. So here we have another sign that it, there is a pickup again in the ninth century, which again would fit with uh, the Muslim sources. Yeah, reemergence of a new market. Right, but by this point, the the sort of the changes that have already happened, you know, as Sam was su suggesting, in the Byzantine period where some towns become are already less important. It's it's coping with those changes that we see. Can I just follow up with one? Yeah. I think both the, two, the earlier presentations were, you know, I think one of the really important things about the work uh, Professor Samardi and David and others have produced is that I think a lot people clearly recognize for quite a long time that these must be pre that were in particularly in the north and deeper that there were a lot of clearly pre-Roman settlements that these places were occupied and that they must have been urban centers. We know some bits and pieces of it. And I think that uh, uh, that the, the real problem has been was that in the colonial period, this just wasn't focused on clearly. And so in a way, this is simply an affirmation of what I think a lot of people recognize for a long time must be the case with a lot of these communities. And it's great to see this because the speculation on this earlier phase was just enormous and clearly not well articulated. And uh, so it is, it is truly a remarkable thing to see these kinds of, finally, the articulation of the, these, these earlier periods. Well, I think that raises an interesting point of the problems with all of these studies cutting across them is that the, the cities that are the most interesting are the ones that continue on. And when cities continue on, people would conveniently build things on top of the things we might want to know. Um, so in Corey's case, Tunis is still a city. It makes it difficult to understand the transition in Tunis uh, Joanna is digging literally underneath the Capitolium of Altiboros. The Tunisians don't really want to take it down to see the full house plan. Um, as Garam as well, the same thing. These seas continue on, and it gives us sort of difficulty in trying to understand these transitions. I'm going to throw in, <coughs> I mean, a appreciating enormously Joanne and David's presentation. I'm going to throw in a question which I know David has been recently answering, but whether when we can talk about urban and how you're using urban. I mean, I think you could just as easily look at this 
very dense settled landscape about which you know there's no doubt as a landscape of villages without the sort of differentiation either monumentally or in terms of crop or whatever that you'd expect in an urban context. Well, I think you know, my, my, my final slide is allow me. I think I was very cleverly censored. I have four slides that all disappeared somewhere in the system. <laughs> and they did, obviously didn't want me to open one by a second. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but ultimately, you know, what, what, what we do see in my, uh, my final slide that you saw said pathways to urbanism. And that's what I want to stress is if, if Phoenicians, Greeks, and Romans don't turn up on the Mediterranean shore, there are pathways towards urbanization that are already underway, that are going to produce something. And that because of that, I mean, those indigenous pathways also feed into the types of sites that actually emerge. You know, we, yes, sure, we get Phoenician and, and Roman influences in the cities, but it's, a, it's an amalgam in the end that we get. And I think, you know, so far, we've really focused on the elements of that urban plan that, you know, are, uh, or the monuments that are characteristic of the external, and we just have neglected to, to try and tease out more, more sense of you know, that, that sort of indigenous contribution into <laughs> the urban plan. And I think, it, you know, again, my, my, you know, the, my final comment, uh, is, if I have my models, is that we need a new agenda of study that takes out the colonialist discourse that has under, underpinned the study, you know, both of the pre-Roman, the Roman, and the post-Roman, and, and, and actually creates a very antipathetic situation uh, for Maghreb <coughs> to engage in a, in a productive way with the pre-Islamic past, or even with past the Islamic past. Mm. Um, you know, um, and we come down to folkloristic approaches to, to the culture. Uh, and I think the sort of information that's coming out of the work that we've been talking about actually does offer us a possible way forward in a post out spring world where to actually look at, at, at the African engagement and contribution with these sort of long-term processes. The other two slides that I lost, if I might just mention that, uh, related to agriculture. I compared the Alpha Boas agricultural package with the Garamantian. What's interesting is that they're different in subtle ways. Uh, and it suggests that actually, you know, it's not a sim simply a single route for agriculture and route for urbanism, but actually we have things that are running in parallel, but also in slightly different ways. Your grapes are, are 500 years later. Sorry? The actual grape seeds are much later. In no, no. no. They're, 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 they're from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, d we don't have m much in the way of pulses, interestingly, mm -hmm. till, until later in, in, in Fasan. But, you know, I, you know, I think uh, th that spread of agriculture, and indeed some of the spread of the urban idea, uh, is coming from slightly different sources. Mm -hmm. What we clearly like is a bunch of new projects that <laughs> dig below the <laughs> Roman levels at um, Timgad and uh, discover whether Timgad was founded on virgin soil in 100 or whether there's actually a pre-Roman settlement there. Same at Queen Cullen, so on. But clearly, um, in much of the area, that's not going to be possible for a while because of security and political reasons uh, and because of finance and so on. Um, how far can we get with the evidence that we've got? What would the map of Roman urbanism look like if you stripped out all the sites with non-Roman names, or um, if you looked at all of those settlements which are on promontories between two deeply incised uh, bodies. I mean, Quico would be well, an obvious exactly. Isn't it interesting? Quico, the Roman colony that doesn't look <laughs> at all like which, a Roman colony. Yeah, which which, which even doesn't have a Roman even, name and is one of your kind of two body sites. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, could we get somewhere with doing that kind of theoretical analysis, place uh, names and topography? Uh, absolutely. I, mean, I think that's the point, that our default assumptions have to shift. And if we shift our default assumptions, then looking at the topography of these sorts of sites, yes, we can say this is almost certainly a site that has an earlier, uh, an earlier origin. I mean, it's an interesting, you know, as you say, we can't absolutely prove all these, but it would be a different point of, uh, of start of departure, wouldn't it? Now, I think Jen had a question. I have sort of a methodological question for David and John. And this is related to um, the, the sort of real-time development of secure chronological markers as a ceramicist. I'm thinking about how it is that you're actually able to think about these chronologies in the first millennium in the kind of subtle way that you've, you've presented here. Because I know your excavations are really 
developing the assemblage for the pre-Roman mm -hmm. profile uh, for North Africa in terms of the ceramics, which are everywhere and are such an important part of it. So I wondered if you could say a little bit about the sort of challenges of both trying to work out the chronology in real time without those tools securely in place. And I mean, even the early Roman pottery is, of course, shifting in terms of its dates and, and some of the problems that that <coughs> presents. So just from a methodological perspective of trying to, to say big things, but not having the, the, some of the tools really locked in place, could you, either of you or both of you, speak to, to the state of your, our understanding of pre-Roman well, chronological markers? I hope I understood well your question. You're asking me about uh, the, the chronological tools, like how we are dating. Uh, okay. Well, uh, for the earliest levels, we are depending on ready carbon. But uh, we have uh, very uh, ancient Phoenician imports, which are archaeologically well dated hmm, to the second half of the 8th century. So the ready carbon evidence is quite consistent with this dating because it comes from uh, levels much below this uh, 8th century uh, pottery. Yes. So uh, we can be quite confident that we are at least, let's say, to in the 9th century BC, and very probably the 10th or even the late 11th uh, century BC. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. I think I, mean, I would just add that the AMS dating is absolutely crucial to both projects. We've uh, both independently adopted a strategy of targeting you know, the single seed of an annual plant uh, from these levels. And if you get enough dates, then you can also start doing Bayesian modeling, uh, which enables you to, to refine the, uh, the, the parameters. Um, and of course, when you do that, then the handmade pottery, which means undateable up to this point, starts to fall into groups as well. So I think in both projects, we've started to construct typologies that can now be used, in fact, potentially over uh, more widely. We've also done uh, MS dating of standing mud brick structures, and I think that's another area where, even if we don't go in and excavate uh, in large scale, we could date an awful lot, particularly of oases, an awful lot of oasis sites could be dated simply by extracting, again, the single olive pit from, uh, from, 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 from the mud brick matrix of, 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 a, of, a, of a Gaza. Uh, can give us a you know a date which you know if if, if consistently um, these things turn out to be late Roman in date as a lot of the Garamantian uh, castles have, have turned out to be well that's pretty conclusive I think. Yeah. I'd like to add to it very quickly. Uh, I think the work we're, we're doing on on the, the pre-Roman period is uh, very important as well uh, to to attack one of the colonial myths about uh, pre-Roman pottery, that it was undateable, that uh, it was the same, exactly the same you would find in a 17th uh, settlement, uh, Berber settlement. Now, we can prove that there is a neat evolution uh, mm -hmm. of this pottery and that you can use it uh, as a dating tool and it is quite different from what you have in medieval and later times. But the problem is with the medieval period, no one's yet done this neat, <coughs> you know, working out the seriation and whatever, or doing as many radiocarbon dates to try and pinpoint the local ceramics. But it's exactly the same issue. We face exactly the same issue with the ceramics. What I meant is that uh, there was the myth mm. that uh, the Berbers were so conservative that we, uh, they were not able to, uh, to evolve <laughs> from this point of view. That's uh, something uh, okay, you, can read, you can read this. Uh, Camps, writings, for example. I think Bruce had a question. Let them go first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I just wondered is there any evidence at all of trans Saharan influences on some of these early pre uh, colonial <laughs> cities uh, in terms of trade and connections, gold, salt, uh, and how old are those great caravan routes that we know from later periods around 1000? Yeah. Well, that, that's very much part of my current project work is, is, is to trace the, the trans-Saharan connections of the Garamantes and, and yes they certainly do, 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 there do seem to be some tangible connections with the sub-Saharan zones um, you know we've got uh, a number of sub-Saharan crops appear in the Garamantian farming repertoire um, you know, in the latter centuries BC they're not part of the initial package 
of agriculture which suggests a different direction mm -hmm. that that's arrived in. But certainly later on, the gang ranchers are, are taking on things like cotton and sorghum and uh, pearl millet from the sub-Saharan zone. Um, you know, we've got evidence of, of, of lots of in-migration of people. Uh, and some of those we think are, are, are sub-Saharan mm. uh, people as well. Possibly taken as slaves, possibly simply married and brought in. Um, but yeah, um, <coughs> it's, it's a big part of the project and work can, that continues. Mm. And also one of our, our talks after the, the coffee break will be featured. Um, Tom Fenn from Yale will be talking specifically about those types of immigrants. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take it in a bit of a different direction, thinking back to Professor Silverstein's talk last night. What is the national, local interest in Numidian, in understanding the Numidians? I just saw Richard Hodge's talk on the Butrint project, and, you know, to the Albanians, you know, they are the Illyrians. This is their heritage. Um, it's not a Roman heritage, but obviously the Roman sites are, you know, preserved and sexy and, you know, touristic. But what is, um, if either of you can speak to the interest in, in uh, and also Corey as well, to be your manifest. Well, let's say that at the beginning we had to face uh, some, let's say, reluctant positions about uh, the possibility to investigate uh, a non punic pre Roman past. Mm -hmm. Well, mm, I think this is clear, clearly uh, due to political reasons. The Berbers passed, so for a republic the, which is defined as Islamic and Arab and, and Arabic, but I got some some misunderstandings as uh, the countries that have inherited the French model of uh, one people, one language. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the very beginning, we had to face this. But afterwards, uh, I think that the fact that we could prove that there was a deep past, uh, avant Carthage, mm -hmm. before Carthage, <laughs> that was the, the motto, uh, <laughs> to, that we have found something extremely interesting because it is very, very old. But I think now it's, uh, uh, the view is changing uh, uh, about uh, the interest of this, uh, of this uh, investigation and the fact that uh, well, to be Tunisian finally is to be uh, the product of uh, different layers of, uh, of culture. <coughs> well, I think this is working in Tunisia because the, the Berber, uh, the Amazigh minority is a, a really a, a real minority. Uh, could that mean a problem uh, in Algeria right now? Uh, I don't know. Uh, does this answer your question? Mm -hmm. I've had a very similar experience in Libya as well. Uh, initially, kind of really a, a, a lack of uh, of association or interest in, in in what this might tell us of relevance to modern Libyans. But increasingly, in the latter stages, what well before the Libyan Revolution, we've had to suspend our work since then. Uh, you know, a, a real realization that this was um, you know a, a notable period in in in, in 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 Libya's history where we have the first towns, we have the first agriculture, the first written language, the first state uh, in the desert. And it's all happening before, you know, European colonists bring it. Uh, and, and that was, you know, that was a very popular and important message that people were picking up and responding to. I think it has become more complicated now, because again, in Libya, um, issues of Berber identity uh, and whose past this really is, uh, you know, may, create new fisher lines, but uh, at least we have some information, some real information. And I would just say, David, I mean, you know, your research post-revolution has seen a lot of echoes, in, at least in terms of how the Department of Antiquities is talking about things, and all of the presentations that I've seen them give, uh, they bring it up not in a very specific way, they don't try to assign it a Berber identity versus a Libyan identity versus an Arab identity, but it's, it's just... It's something that uh, you know people are proud of. It's just proof that uh, Libya has this long past. Yeah, and, um, yeah. and I, I always talk about Libyan rather than Berber in, mm -hmm. in the context of the ancient uh, Libyans. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a big distinction, though, between actually Algerian and Tunisian takes on this. The Tunisians have had a practically official policy of descending from the 
uh, this was Ben Ali's thing, mm -hmm. for, of being Punic mm -hmm. as their past, mm -hmm. um, and have supported all things Punic, and are, as you say, a little less interested in Numidians, whereas the Algerian, uh, the large Berber population of Algeria is just fixated on Massinissa and Jugurtha and so on, you know, as we saw yesterday, <coughs> and really don't have any interest in the Punic thing. So it's contested at the level of, of different state politics. Wow. Just let me point, picking up on something you said, I know of virtually no town in Rome, Africa, apart from occasionally one, I think, a place on the Martinian coast, and places like Berea Celia and the estates, that there's no Roman town that has a Latin name. You know, it's original names. And they're, they're, they're all, interestingly enough, there was an article published in 1923, I think, Review Oriental, in which all of the names were broken down, much the way we've done, for example, in Gaul and others, and all of the names looked to be, you know, indigenous names, referring to settlements very similar to the way David described them, uh, a settlement by the wed. You know, they translate as in the same way. You know, I, I can think of no Latin town, name town in North Africa, uh, specifically except one on, I think, Nova, you know, there's a one on Mar Western Martinia. They're all indigenous names. Omar. What's that? Omar. <laughs> Degenerating yeah. people I was going to say <laughs> Roman <laughs> town <laughs> names. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's great. I think we're going to try and wrap up the discussion and move on to. We're having a coffee break now for 20 minutes, I think. Um, to start again at 11, but I'd like to thank our speakers again and our discussants for some, some interesting conversation. Thanks very much. By way of a preface to my introduction of the first speaker in our second session, uh, first of all, I guess I should say I realize that most of you don't know or probably care who I am. But uh, when I was starting to do my graduate work, which was on the history of, of North Africa and late antiquity, there were these four great luminaries of, uh, of archaeology. There was very little historical work being done on, on North Africa, but there were four great luminaries of, of archaeology who sort of defined for me what the parameters of inquiry were. Uh, and it's, it, it's an enormous pleasure that three of those four are here today. Uh, one is Susan Stevens, with whom I dug in North Africa, and she's obviously not here. Uh, but, but Bruce Hitchner, David Mattingly, and this uh, incredibly engaging, uh, fiercely insightful, and always sort of iconoclastic and well worth reading scholar called Elizabeth Fentress. Um, Elizabeth Fentress uh, has carried out surveys and excavations in Central Italy and North Africa, and she co-directs the INP Oxford, Oxford excavations at Utica. She's working on the publication of the excavations of Lubulus and Villamagna, in Italy, and a book on slaving states in antiquity. Uh, she's the president of the International Association for Classical Archaeology. She's also the scientific director of the AIAC's FASTI Online, a database of archaeological excavations in Italy uh, and 12 other countries. And today, she is going to speak to us about the question of identifying pastoral Berbers, which if I can actually click the slide will come up. Uh, identifying pastoral Berbers. So please join me in welcoming Lisa Fentress. Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks to Corey, Andy, and uh, Brett for organizing this, and Sue for sponsoring this whole series. It's always a pleasure to come to Brown. Um, I was actually asked to talk about Berber mobility and quailed and said, I'll talk about Berber identity instead. But um, so this is a mix of the two. Um, it's clearly a vast program to try and identify a Berber unless, as I said in my book about them, they say that they're, they tell you that they're a Berber and preferably that they speak the languages. Um, so, I mean, there's nothing that would immediately tell us that Juba the second on the left or Zinedine Zidane um, on the right, one of the greatest football players of all time, uh, are Berbers. 
though um, the Libyan gentleman in the middle um, from an Egyptian tomb is identified as such. Um, they do all have curly hair, including Zinedine Zidane, I'm told. <laughs> Uh, our tendency for the Roman period, when of course we know that all indigenous people are by default uh, Berbers, but is to look at the folkloric, the primitive, and the weird, the exotic, um, like these two stele from the Kabylie, possibly second, first century BC, where they're um, helpfully identified, both of them, by their names on inscriptions in the Libyan alphabet, so that um, you can see immediately that they are speaking a Berber language. Um, and they both, if you look, have horses, possibly uh, not because they're pastoralist, but beca because that's a symbol of royalty. Um, but these three Numidian kings um, would equally not be remotely obvious unless you knew who they were again. Note the curly hair. Um, as far as religious practices are concerned, we could as well go on to um, the more exotic flavor of a sanctuary like that of the Di Maori at Simitu, Shemtu, with its series of uh, rock-cut busts, which identify this crowd of eight unnamed Di Maori. Um, we see them again on this relief from the Bardo Museum. Um, one of them, the one in the center is a woman, if you look closely. But apart from that, I mean, she's distinguished by a lack of beard, apart from curly hair. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is one form of exoticism. Another one would be the cave at which, near Sirta, the god Bacchax was worshipped. Though we know that because there are inscriptions to him in Latin from the local magistrates of the local Roman town. So um, it's not as exotic as all that. And then deeply folkloric and exotic is the sanctuary of Slanta in Cyrenaica with these bound captives. There's a massive serpent and most exotic of all, you have uh, this series of heads which appear to be severed. Now, the doubt remains that they might just have lost their bodies, except that if we go to Tripolitania um, and the site of Girsa, you find uh, another set of apparently severed heads, um, together with a scene of sacrifice with an altar and a sacrificing person. Um, so you could say, well, look, there's exotic and barbaric, except that, of course, these same uh, Berber people are creating altars like the great one at Quicol, uh, showing the accoutrements of a perfectly Roman sacrifice. They're not easy to identify um, unless you know. If we look at the elite monuments, we've already seen this one, um, the great altar at Simitu and its reconstruction, which Anne Kuttner, in a recent article, has shown is speaking very closely to Attalid Macedonian monuments. Um, and if it weren't for the round shields, which are characteristic of Numidians on the front, um, we weren't going to pick that up. The Numidian elite which is multilingual, certainly. Masinissa spoke Greek as well as Latin and uh, Libyan, um, were clearly talking to other Mediterranean elites and were quite eclectic in their choice of symbols. This is a tomb like the one you saw at Duga uh, from Burgu on Jerba, which I think is a Numidian city. Um, it shows a, the bust of a man wearing a collar who's very clearly Egyptianizing. Um, the monument has a uh, pyramid on top, which of course reminds us of mausolea like Duga, Sabratha, and Siga, a series of tombs, princely, shall we say, tombs, that take us right around the coast of North Africa 
and seem to be, at the very least, distinguishing themselves from Punic tombs of the same day. But what is Berber about them? Not very obvious. However, if we look, and Joan Samarti has been showing us other Berber tombs and tumuluses, there's a very particular type of tumulus, a drum surrounding a cyst with a tumulus on top, uh, called a bazina uh, locally, um, which does seem to be very characteristic of pre-Roman uh, cemeteries in North Africa. It's probably almost more common than those tombs that uh, Joanne was showing us, which do still have some relationship to Mediterranean dolmens. Um, now, this is very clearly a piece of identity. We find it in... Uh, the, under the forum of Simitu around 400 BC. These are sadly unpublished because of warring archaeologists. And we find it uh, most famously at the Medrasin, where this quite clearly indigenous tomb type has been given a very uh, Hellenistic window dressing in the form of that lovely colonnade and uh, throat cornice and a series of things that led Filippo Correlli to identify it as based on the tomb of Alexander. Since we don't have the tomb of Alexander, <laughs> <laughs> easy stuff. <laughs> but um, it's clearly still sufficiently an <coughs> identity uh, issue that Lollis Urbicus, who was governor of Britain, um, and then probably Praefectus Urbi, in uh, dying in 160, builds one at Tidis, his origin, an old Numidian town, in very similar <coughs> shapes. And he's clearly referring back there. It's 100 meters or so from the first one that I showed you. <coughs> Inside the tombs, you have, as Joan said, either dis, um, defleshed bones, which are just simply piled up there, or you have crouched flexed uh, lateral burials. These are very typical. And one thing that is typical from a much earlier date is the presence of um, ochre on the bones, possibly coming from ochre-dyed wrappings. Nobody's really quite sure how the ochre gets there. Another thing that, as we've seen very much from David and Joanne's talks, is typical is this position for settlements. Um, I, I won't linger on this because David's done it so well, but there is Tidis that he talked about with um, this, it's the red spot on that hill in the middle distance. Um, these are fortified promontories. Uh, another example is the site of Ishukana, um, again surrounded by two very deep ravines uh, with, you can see a wall foundation in the middle distance, and in this case, there's a rampart that bars the neck of the promontory. This would be a lovely site, as Joanne and I were saying this morning, for investigations because it has no Roman on top of it. It's only about 17 k's from Timgad and was probably abandoned at the time of the foundation of Timgad. But it's in Algeria, and things are awfully complicated. Um, still, I've wanted to dig, dig that for about 35 years. Um, and finally, of course, here's Kwiku, which uh, David was saying, you know, why isn't this a pre-Roman settlement? The position is absolutely classic. So uh, this is true, the phenomenon that David was talking about, and stretches right into Morocco. Uh, where all those pale gray dots um, are pre-Roman settlements that you cannot, you could at a stretch call those black ones, which are as early as the 8th and 7th centuries, Phoenician, though Emanuele Papi argues very strongly against this. Um, on the other hand, the inland sites with the gray dots are certainly not, and sites like Tabusida, Arrera are showing major defenses by the second century BC. Now, all of this speaks to this settled, highly nucleated 
I think of them as more villages than urban until the second century, but to this pattern of settlement. So you have to ask yourself why authors from Herodotus onward describe the Berbers as pastoral. You know, how did they not know? And I think that there is very little doubt that, um, that pastoral Berbers were known to Roman authors, that they existed, and that they were a significant part of the economy, um, with indeed these representations of Mappalia. Um, this is uh, one of the things mentioned by a series of people as the portable housing that they used. The only good example I could find is something I shot uh, last year, which is a Fulani one. And the Fulanis are not Berbers, so it's a cheat, but gives you the general idea <laughs> of how pastoral people can put up a hut very, very quickly. Um, so where is this pastoral, uh, pastoral and mobile and nomadic component that we see represented? Our first ideas of the Gadamantes are Herodotus saying they hunt the Ethiopians on uh, chariots, and we find them represented beautifully on uh, rock paintings, uh, which are part of the discourse that has nothing to do with Zinkekra and Garama or does it? Um, I think that what I want to uh, say is that we can't really disassociate this pastoral component from our picture of the settled villages. I think that we've been in such a hurry to say, but look, and myself included, but look, excuse me, there are hundreds of Berber villages. What are you talking about? These aren't pastoral uh, barbarians. Um, that we're, we're, we're devaluing the pastoral component. So what I want to do in the second part of this is very quickly something that I've been working on, a new form of evidence, um, which is not archaeological. There, one can do archaeology of pastoral peoples. It's never been done in North Africa, and I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about mobility from the point of view of linguistics. Now, these are, uh, this is a work that's not yet published by two linguistics people, um, uh, Christopher Errett at UCLA and Andrew Kitchen at Oklahoma, on the clading, on the family tree, if you like, of the Berber languages. What they're doing is comparing word lists and giving a chronological value to the separation of the languages. This is contested. It's certainly the chronology is more contested. What's much less contested is actually the uh, family tree. So you can take the numbers with a grain of salt, but the results are still interesting. Now, um, they have shown, I think very much more convincingly, that uh, somewhere between the 8th and the 6th century, you have a separation of the whole of the Berber languages from the Chadic languages to which they're most closely related. This is taking place somewhere between the Nile and the Horn of Africa, and that is certain and really not contested at all. The Chadic languages go south, the Berber languages go north. And the very earliest separation that we can see up at the top of the tree is that of Zenaga. Um, now, this the language of Zanaga actually exists today down there, the furthest southwest point of Mauritania, which is a long way from the Horn of Africa. Well, you've got 4,000 years for them to move. We don't know how they move. We don't know when they move. They can't be shown to move archaeologically. But it does seem not improbable that one of the sources of their mobility is the donkey, which was uh, domesticated in Cyrenaica in the second millennium BC. Um, they are probably not moving through the tell of North Africa, where all we find for this period are Capsian sites. All Berbers want to be Capsians. God knows why. It's the most <laughs> conservative, boring, not interesting prehistoric period in the Mediterranean, according to me. I mean, I'm not prehistoric. Um, but uh, and they tend to discount the very clear historical evidence 
for origins around the Nile, um, where in about 1300 you start having Egyptian references to Libyans, to the Meshwesh, and eventually you even get a Libyan dynasty, of course. You get the Stila of Passion, or you've got very clear uh, nomadic Libyans raiding settled agriculture, and at that point having shifted from donkeys to horses. And you know, if you read David Anthony, the aggressive and uh, the potential of horses is not only for movement, it's also for attack. Um, it horse using societies agglomerate a larger number of people. I'm wondering if it isn't these people that are settling Zinkhefra, of course, in 1000 BC, but also the tell itself, moving across the line of the shots in the pre desert, <coughs> not moving along the coast where they leave the cave of Halafatia with people still not practicing agriculture, incidentally. Um, so this spread of languages, you can see it encompasses all of the known Berber languages, um, goes again right across North Africa, and we have no idea about that long tail to the south. That's completely invented. Um, so we're seeing this series of pulses that have to do with the introduction of a new language that wipes out the other ones in the area that you find them. And this third family is particularly interesting. They did it around 500 BC, say give or take 200 years. It doesn't much matter. What's interesting is that it does not include the languages of the Kabylie. So it doesn't include the Kabyl, and probably it doesn't include the languages of the Tell. Uh, the languages of the Tell remain separate. And what you've got is this new set along the southern fringes, again, along what Malika Hashid has called the superhighway of the desert that's running through uh, up to the base of the Ores and then through the Saharan Atlas to the coast. This coincides just too well with the uh, Gaichuli, who Pliny tells us were already found on the Atlantic coast in 100 BC, and, um, but go as far east as Ogila. Now we have all these Roman references to the Gaichuli, of course. What's very interesting is that Apuleius, who describes himself as half Numidian, and half Gaichuli can still in the second century AD find these very clearly identifiable. Does it make sense that they're identifiable on the basis of their language differences? And the line of separation between them and the Numidians runs right through where Apuleius lived and still today uh, you know, seems to be a fairly clear demarcating line. Well, as time goes on, um, it seems that the Libyan, the Berber languages, are disappearing in Roman North Africa. There's no, um, there are no inscriptions after the third century AD that we know of, or very, very few, and in particular places. And uh, we don't know, of course, where that pulse is coming from, but by this point, I would say it was somewhere in the desert where you've got a very large population. David has been talking about the oases and their importance. I think that we've got this same uh, growth of population and a really quite successful mixing of pastoral and sedentary societies in the desert. The final one um, has been the subject of a long paper by Andrew Wilson and myself um, for a congress organized by Jonathan, um, uh, which is this group that seems to be as late as 400 AD. Now, this is a language group that's been known for 100 years, and it's been called the Zenatic languages. Uh, but nobody's actually put together the fact that these languages, A, appear around 400 AD, and B, cover precisely the area that seems to have been the subject of major invasions. We know this from St. Augustine. We know this from, uh, by the time Procopius and Charippus see 100 years later, North Africa 
these people are called Maori and they are the enemy. Um, they appear almost out of nowhere, though the point of entry for St. Augustine is the Hodna Basin, so somewhere in the middle of that red blob. And they go with a lot of archaeological markers. Saharan tomb types come back, Bazina types with niches in them, um, clear references to the Sahara, of which the most obvious is uh, this group of tombs called the Jedar, um, with their beautifully cut masonry and pyramidal shape that is a memory exercise of the first water saying, we came from the Sahara. Um, they were the successor kingdoms. I mean, they were the Merovingians, if you like. Um, they are very clearly using not only the, um, the aggressive side of a nomadic economy that in this case goes with camels, as we know from Charybdis and Procopius, um, but also the sedentary side, which as Andrew and David have shown, depends on irrigation agriculture and a very successful way of uh, combining agriculture and nomadic life. Um, so possibly we can't so easily identify nomadic Berbers um, because they're actually the ones we're seeing in the villages as well. And possibly those cemeteries like that around Altibiros with the bones stripped of their flesh, which might have been moved from other sites for reburial, it's a theory of comps, um, are also testifying to the same phenomenon. Thanks. to have both papers back to back and follow that uh, with a discussion of the themes that emerge, well, of the individual points, but also the themes that emerge from both of the papers jointly. Uh, and therefore, it's my pleasure to introduce now uh, Thomas Fenn. Uh, Thomas Fenn is the director of the Center for the Study of Ancient Pyrotechnology at Yale University. His research covers a wide range of materials, regions, and time periods with common threads of examining socioeconomic and technological aspects of ancient technologies, including themes of long distance trade, uh, provenance studies, invention and innovation in ancient technologies, and the development and transfer of technical no excuse me, technological knowledge and materials. Uh, and Dr. Fenn has a bachelor's in anthropology and archaeology, a master's uh, in geosciences, and a doctorate in anthropology and archaeology. Uh, today, he's going to talk to us about metallurgical evidence for trans-Saharan movement. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fenn. Thank you very much. Uh, today, um, I started off by submitting this topic uh, uh, because of the request of the organizers to look at uh, trans-Saharan movement of materials. And uh, following the theme being more uh, North African focused, I, I changed uh, uh, a little bit the focus of the title. So now it's more uh, North African, but with, uh, uh, with a nod to the trans-Saharan as well. So, and I'll, and I'll kind of tell you why it's more of a nod at this point than, than anything. So uh, primarily what we're going to look at is, uh, you know, some of the questions about what's going on in, in metallurgical uh, uh, North Africa is looking at the consumption patterns in, in metals. Uh, looking at shifting supplies through time, and, uh, and also looking at the advent of trans-Saharan uh, contacts and, and movement of materials, and in this case, uh, in metal specifically. So to that end, uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about some technical uh, data, some isotopic data uh, available on materials from North and West Africa, uh, examine some of the comparisons between those different data types, and then uh, examine uh, West African connections as well. Uh, you can see the outline there of, uh, of the region that I'm going to focus on in North Africa, sort of the greater, uh, mostly in Tunisia and greater area around Carthage, and then a few sites in West Africa that I'll touch base with. 
So uh, in terms of thinking about the uh, connections, uh, initially um, the Carthage and the uh, Punic materials, you can see here a, a representation of what that period uh, looked like on the landscape and the, the connection with areas such as southern Spain, southeastern Spain and Sardinia and other regions like that uh, are important connections and uh, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Of course that, that network uh, of connections, uh, of Punic connections was sort of overlain by Roman uh, uh, occupations and, and presence later and the movement of materials around the Mediterranean from these regions and through Carthage uh, um, are, are very present uh, in the archaeological remains including the materials uh, that we find. This is true for the, for the metallurgy as well. So uh, I had an opportunity to work with some materials from uh, Tunisia uh, to explore this very question and uh, these were are some of the sites. Uh, these are not necessarily the the full uh, range of dates for those sites, but the primary uh, dates uh, associated with the materials uh, that I'm, I'm studying. And you can see there, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, of Punic sites, uh, a fairly uh, wider range of uh, Roman sites, and then um, some components that are sort of crossover Punic uh, Roman and weren't, weren't really differentiated. But uh, we're getting an opportunity to look at, at the transition from, from the Punic into the early and then into the later Roman. Uh, as, a, as a nod to the, the Islamic period as well. I have a lot more information on that, but I'm not going to uh, get into that as much today. Um, so uh, before I get into looking at the materials, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the technology uh, that I'm using for the analyses. I'm not going to focus on that too much. I'll be glad to talk about that later. But it is a provenance-based uh, study. We're working with lead isotopes, and uh, primarily what we're doing is we're trying to look at the origin of the lead within the metal objects. Most of the materials I'm looking at today are, in fact, lead objects uh, with a handful of, of uh, non-ferrous copper-based objects as well. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine uh, if the lead uh, can be traced back to its origin. Uh, there uh, is no uh, change in the isotopic ratio due to the metal metallurgical processes, so we're fortunate in that uh, that we can use that as a, as a means to, to look at the uh, origins. Now there are a couple of assumptions associated with this uh, technology uh, and that is that uh, we're working with uh, lead uh, that's uh, from, from one ore source and uh, with the uh, concepts of recycling and, and reuse of uh, materials uh, that's always a, a potential issue um, and you can see that down below. Uh, but also the other uh, assumption is that the uh, geological origins of the raw materials have a sort of characteristic signature and, uh, and that is, uh, is true in many cases but there can be overlap between some of those uh, regions as well. Um, the technique is a, um, a lead isotope analysis. We use a multi-collector ICPMS to do the work on this and basically we'll, what we're looking at is the ratio between four different isotopes and that acts to provide us with a uh, means of, of differentiating the ore sources where the, where the metals originate. Okay, without much uh, further ado, I'm going to move into the, <laughs> the, uh, the region. Okay, now this is a, a, a map of the region showing most of the geology underneath it. And uh, overlaying on that in the red are the sites uh, that the materials come from. Uh, so you can see we've got a fairly decent representation of some of the geological provinces. I believe this is a uh, pointer here. Okay. So you can see we've got uh, four major zones. The Nap zone, we've got the Diapir zone here, we've got uh, what's called the Graben zone, and then we've got this north-south axis. And uh, what I've done is I've thrown in here a line between what we want to consider the coastal sites uh, and the inland sites. And this uh, becomes uh, apparent later when we're looking at the, uh, uh, the, the results of this analysis that there is a clear differentiation between the coastal and the interior. Uh, to some of the sites, this is uh, unfortunately we don't have a very large uh, sample of uh, objects that we can definitively uh, label as Punic, but, uh, but there's a very clear difference between the lead objects coming from the context on the coast and the bronze objects coming from the objects on the coast. And these, these break down in the isotopic uh, patterns here into two distinct groups. Now there, these are, there are subgroups within these fields, but you can see there's a clear difference between the, uh, the lead and the bronze. So there are different sources of metal providing, uh, um, providing those to the coastal sites. When we move uh, to a little bit later period and start looking at the Roman sites, we can see a, a series of different patterns that, uh, that come to the forefront. First, you've got uh, you know, in, inland lead uh, from the early uh, Roman period that kind of clusters here. You've got coastal lead from the early Roman period that kind of clusters. 
We have uh, coastal lead from the uh, later Roman period that clusters. Uh, we have coastal bronzes that kind of split between a couple of the different groups here. And, uh, and so you can see that there are uh, dis definitely distinguishable patterns going on uh, in the consumption of metal and the uh, areas that these metals are originating. Looking at that same uh, data again, um, we can now kind of conflate uh, these uh, different data sets and think about uh, changes through time. The R1 is early Roman, the R2 is uh, later Roman. Again, we see the, the coastal lead from the Punic, the uh, coastal lead from the, the Roman. We see the uh, inland lead from the Punic Roman, uh, early Roman and late Roman. We see the coastal uh, lead from the Roman II and the coastal bronze uh, being split kind of into two groups there. So there, there are shifts uh, in the consumption of these materials through time and space. Uh, initially, in the earliest periods, uh, you're seeing a... Uh, a pattern of, uh, of, the, of the coastal lead uh, being here, but <coughs> as soon as you move into the Roman period, you see a shift in the source for the lead supplying those coastal sites. Uh, when you look at the inland lead uh, through all the time periods, you tend to see uh, a lot of overlap, though there are, of course, a few coastal uh, pieces in there as well. So there's, there's a, some of this stuff is working its way to the coast. When you move into the later Roman, you see, again, a shift. This is the, Rome, the early Roman, and then you see a shift back uh, to a region near where the, uh, the Punic material is coming during this, the later Roman period. So this is interesting, uh, through time uh, you're, and space, you're seeing these, these changing patterns in terms of the, uh, the material that's being supplied to these sites uh, and where this material is coming from. So to, to look at that a little closer, we're going to move into that. Uh, but before, uh, whoops, I hit the wrong button here. Okay, there we go. Okay, back, uh, back to this picture again to, to sort of uh, reconnect with uh, the regions because, there, again, there are these four regions. So you have the Nap zone, you have the, the Diapir zone, you have the uh, Graben zone, and you have the North-South axis. Now, these are important for this discussion because each of these zones have slightly different geological origins in terms of the ore deposits that are in these zones. And the differences between those geologies create different isotopic patterns in the metals that come from them. So in terms of thinking about uh, consumption uh, from a local, locally available ore deposits, there is the possibility that we can differentiate different regions within, the, within Tunisia. Okay, so uh, we're going to go back to this. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is uh, a, an overlay uh, of the different ore deposits. Now, the outlines of these are... are are just to, to help with the visualization. As you can see, they look like some sort of a, an amoeba at this point, but uh, I think uh, there'll be a, a little more uh, clarification of that as we go through time. So again, the, the major sort of categories we're seeing here are these uh, sort of Punic uh, through Roman, uh, inland and coastal lead, and some bronzes all falling on top of what are characteristic of Tunisian ore sources. So, you know, this seems to be a pattern suggestive of local consumption, local production and consumption, uh, both on the interior and the coast, and not just of lead, but also some of the materials are, are, are coming out as these uh, bronzes as well. But then we have another group over here, which is uh, a Roman coastal lead and uh, Punic and late Roman uh, coastal bronze. So there's another group that clearly is not coming from the, uh, the ore deposits in Tunisia. And so it's, it's uh, a question as to where, where these other deposits are located and where this material may be coming from. So in terms of comparing these through time, these are the different, uh, rather through uh, space, these are the different ore deposits, again, uh, by, by zone. Uh, in Tunisia, with the exception of the last one here, you can see that, uh, for the most part, the three earlier zones all have quite a bit of overlap with these, and, and this one here is kind of peripheral to, to most of these, with the exception of a few of these ones in the upper part. So uh, there's the possibility of several of these zones having contributed. Uh, the ability to differentiate between these uh, uh, zones is a little more uh, complicated than I want to get into today. So I'm going to kind of just leave it at that, uh, that level of uh, expression. Um, there's also an additional uh, amount of published uh, material that's uh, sort of general, sort of Punic Roman unspecified, uh, as well as Roman unspecified. And that's the turquoise and the olive green here. And so you can see, again, the majority of this stuff uh, breaks down, again, into these two groups that we're starting to get 
you know, a smattering of material that kind of falls in between uh, this, this region as well. So what does that mean? Well, if we kind of overlay our uh, uh, ore deposits from Tunisia again, I think we can see that now we don't necessarily have two groups. Perhaps we've got three sort of very broad general groups where we have a, you know, a cluster of material down here. We've got, again, a lot of the material that's consistent with the Tunisian ores. And then we've got kind of a zone that falls in between. And perhaps this is a, you know, reflective of recycling of metals or perhaps another source, uh, you know, or, or even a mixing. I mean, if you've got, you know, broadly metals from a couple of different regions here and you start mixing or recycling the metals between the two, you're going to end up with something kind of in between. Um, but, it, you know, again, it's, it's never quite as simple as that. So um, let's complicate it a little bit more. Um, if we go to this point here, what I've done now is I've, I've started, started to bring in a little bit of the Trans-Saharan contacts. And up here, we have two sites that I, I pointed out at the beginning, uh, Kisi, which is in Burkina Faso. The dates for that are around the, the second century AD to around the seventh century AD. Uh, and Merendet, which is a very important site, sub-Saharan site in Niger, which was directly connected to the Trans-Saharan trade and had a major, major metallurgical uh, component to it. Uh, and that dates from around uh, the 6th to the 8th and a bit later in terms of its uh, time period. So, so it's nice because it, it gives us a little bit of a glimpse of what's going on before we see the major uh, you know, pulse from the, uh, uh, the, the Islamic influence in North Africa. But again, you see that similar pattern. So we've got Kissy objects that are landing in here and here and here. And we've got objects from Merendet that are landing here in here. So the, the pattern of consumption uh, that we're seeing, you know, in the, pro, the, the Punic and Roman context in North Africa is, is being mirrored in, in a slightly later time periods in these sub-Saharan contexts. So that's an important, uh, you know, uh, op, you know to, to note to make because we can see that the, not only are the, the local consumption patterns in the north uh, uh, fitting, fitting this, but they're the same type of materials are working their way across the, har the Sahara. Uh, we're seeing materials that apparently are, are locally produced here and then other materials that are imported uh, also working their way across the Sahara. So to think about briefly what, where, where some of these uh, other materials may be coming from, I'm going to touch again, going back to that, those first maps that I showed you of the extent of the, uh, the Punic and the Roman uh, influence in the Mediterranean. These are some uh, ore deposits from uh, nearby. Uh, this is southeastern Spain. Uh, ore deposits, and you can see we've got a nice uh, spread of those right through this area here. Uh, and, and very interesting, we get a nice dense concentration of those up here as well. So even though we've got overlap uh, with these uh, objects here with some of the Tunisian ores, we also have a possibility of southeastern Spain acting as a source as well. And that's really not that surprising because geologically Spain and Sardinia in the northern coastal strip uh, of North Africa share a common geological history. If we take it and uh, add another, uh, there's a lot of ore deposits in Sardinia. Again, you see a, a smattering of those kind of in this group down here. Uh, a, you know, a bunch of them landing here and uh, a few of them kind of scattered around. So it seems that they also potentially could have uh, been a contributing source for, for, this, uh, for this import group. And finally, if we, if we think about the expanse of the, of the Roman Empire going all the way to the eastern boundaries of it, uh, the Near East and the Middle East uh, clearly had an important uh, part to play in it as well. And these are ore deposits from Iran in, in green. And you can see that they cover quite a bit of this area here uh, and very much also could have been a contributing factor. And particularly with this sort of intermediary group here, uh, you, there, there are quite a few possible ore deposits in Iran that could have contributed to that. So you, you have representation across the Roman Empire of materials that are moving around the Mediterranean and, and going through Carthage, as we saw from the, the map earlier, the trade map. So there's uh, no reason to think that these couldn't, couldn't have worked their way into this group. Finally, I'm going to blow up, blow up that center um, part right here. Again, show you a very chaotic display of uh, dots on the screen. Uh, for the main purpose of showing you that uh, the green here, which is the, uh, the Tunisian ore up here, uh, that really probably accounts for the bulk of, of what we're seeing. I'm not differentiating it by zone now, but all of these uh, green and black circles, all of the blue and black circles, uh, these are, are, you know, a lot of our, our Roman and Punic materials, and they, they're consistent with the uh, Tunisian materials. You also see, again, a little bit of this Iranian stuff, a little bit of the, the Spain, uh, but more, more generally there, they're consistent with the, the Tunisian materials. However, this group of materials up here 
uh, actually shows a much stronger continuity with the southeastern Spain ore deposits. And so maybe what we're really seeing there is material coming from, from Roman provinces and, and, and maybe uh, Punic Phoenician provinces in, in southeastern Spain and working its way to, to, uh, to Tunisia. Uh, we've also got another group down here. I throw in here some, some ore from Lorium because the, the Greece, uh, of course, was part of the, uh, the Roman Empire as well. And there were important uh, deposits of lead and silver in that region as well. And, and they worked their way into the uh, Mediterranean world and towards uh, Carthage as well. So uh, unfortunately, we can't rule that out as a possibility here. But we also see that, again, there is overlap with the Tunisian ores, which just as easily could account for, for some of that variability. Uh, and then we've got a few, few outliers here that uh, right now there's, uh, there's no clear match with them. One other thing I throw in here is this, uh, these lead ores from, these are all from a shipwreck off the coast of Tunisia and based on, they all had these big lead ingots in it that connected uh, clearly back to uh, lead sources in southeastern Spain. So that sort of adds, adds uh, credibility to that as the uh, source area. So finally, just to kind of wrap things up here, I'm going to talk about some other briefly uh, metallurgical things. And one of the things that we know about, about uh, metallurgy from Carthage, from the Roman time period, is this workshop here where they found these uh, wonderful uh, pieces of, uh, of fragments of ingot molds. And those <coughs> ingot molds uh, show, uh, you know, show these nice little slots where you're casting uh, ingots in these. Uh, um, uh, Talcott looked at these things and thought some of these things could be molds for uh, nail blanks, bronze nail blanks and everything. But regardless of the technology for, for producing the blanks and the ingots is very similar. And in terms of what we see across the Sahara, we see almost exact duplicates for these. These are both from Merendet, from the site that I showed you, the metallurgy. Uh, this was discovered by Andre Lot in the late 50s. I, I did this as part of my own field work, found some of these ingot molds uh, also at uh, Merendet. And so you can see that the, the technology for, uh, for the production and movement of materials as ingots and ingot forms uh, is uh, spreading uh, potentially across the Sahara as well. And on the western part of the Sahara, there is a uh, a group of uh, similar ingots and in, uh, objects from a slightly later date time period. This is uh, into the Islamic period uh, at the site of uh, Tegdos, the Wadagus in uh, southern Mauritania. So in conclusion, um, I think we can see that they're clearly, you know, during the Punic and Roman periods, uh, the non-ferrous metals are coming from both local and uh, imported uh, sources. I think we've got clear exploitation of ore deposits in the interior of Tunisia that are that are supplying uh, the Punic world. We also have, uh, beginning in the Roman period, a, a dramatic increase in imported materials coming in, probably from other Roman provinces, from Spain, from Sardinia, potentially from the Near East as well. Uh, and, but you see a continued exploitation of the interior. But uh, during the early Roman, there seems to be a greater emphasis on the imported metal. And then as you shift into this, the later Roman period, you see, again, a, a rise in the importance of the interior uh, sources, uh, they, they now are providing more metal again to, to feed the consumption patterns uh, in the late Roman Empire. And you saw, also see that these same kind of patterns of consumption uh, are reflected in the metals moving across the Sahara to some of these early uh, contexts in, in <coughs> sub-Saharan Africa as well. Um, unfortunately, and, you know, and there are other lines of evidence as well, such as the, the molds and, and, and more other, uh, other pieces that I haven't really talked about. But, you know, really we're... Um, we're just kind of uh, scratching the tip of the iceberg on this right now. And unfortunately, there's just really a lack of uh, data for sub-Saharan West Africa for this critical time period from that late first millennium BC into the first half of the uh, millennium AD. Uh, this is something that uh, D David and I were talking about the, uh, last night. And that's just, you know, there, if we could get more material from that time period, I think we could really get a better picture of it. And his work he's, that he's doing with the Garamantes is, is definitely a, s a step in that direction. Um, and so I, I implore to the audience now, if you uh, send me your samples, uh, <laughs> but particularly for the pre-Roman context as well, uh, and also for the, uh, the transition into the Islamic period. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of the uh, organizations that provided samples and funds and assistance in this research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Lisa, if I could stay, stay, stay. Lisa, if I could get you up here, uh, and we've got uh, a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Maybe we can have a, a discussion of either paper individually or both papers collectively, and the sorts of questions uh, that they raise. I've actually got a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about the Ores Mountains, where there are huge deposits of lead mm -hmm. that we know are being exploited in the third century BC? Mm -hmm. Because the 
the medrasa is actually built with lead. Uh, Kant, Kant, exactly. Right. And it's been estimated there's like four tons of lead used in its construction. I mean, could that be a source for any of the? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, I didn't want to get into the geological background of this too much, but there is uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence from the early uh, during the colonial period, the French colonial period, when they were going and then sort of uh, documenting the resources in the region. You know, many of these deposits they would note, you know, ancient workings and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. there. You know, and whether these were medieval or, or Roman or, or Punic or, or, or what is, is isn't really clear. But uh, there's been extensive exploitation of a lot of these deposits that, that were utilized. And I think that would be a, a wonderful phase of this research, uh, which we were also talking about last night, which would be go out to the field, to these ore deposits, and document some of the ancient mining and, and metallurgical uh, practices going on there, and, and, and ideally to, to, to collect some samples for, for dating use as well, and an idea the time depth of their, their usage. Yeah, I was wondering what the kind of functional aspect of these metals is. Are so you describe a lot of samples, but are you specifically targeting specific uses of the lead, or um, architectural uses, or more S generally? Some of these are architectural lead. They're, they're lead came from architectural. Some of the there's a, some of the published stuff were uh, some of the curse scrolls, you know, the lead, the, the Roman curse scrolls. Um, but a lot of the pieces are architectural pieces. They're lead that were that were built in as part of architectural units. Some of it's scrap lead that lead that was uh, found in different archaeological contexts, um, which you know the, the function of it is, is well known. Uh, most of these samples I didn't analyze myself. I was actually provided this uh, a lot of the, the data from a colleague of mine who'd analyzed them 30 years ago and never published it. So he provided that data to me. I analyzed a lot of the ore samples from Tunisia, actually, and a small uh, number of samples from some of the peripheral sites. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely a functional uh, component to this that could add another dimension to it, which, which isn't really explored at this point in the, in the data because of the nature of the, the samples and, and the origin of the data. You showed us a map of lots of the ore deposits containing lead. Mm -hmm. Then you showed us one of any in North Africa containing copper. Are there any? And if not, would that be the simple explanation for why your bronze stuff has lead that matches the coastal signatures, i.e. It's, it's not local because it's actually coming in already made as bronze? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, one uh, is that many of the deposits that I showed are not just lead. They are actually lead and copper ore deposits. Um, and often the copper and lead will show up in the same deposits anyway. So if they're going after copper, they'll exploit the lead at the same time. Uh, in, in that sense, the copper, as it's produced as a metal, will have the exact same isotopic signature as the lead from that same deposit. Um, the imported metals uh, will obviously not have the same uh, isotopic signature unless they're recycled and then mixed with local materials. And then that was why I showed that, that mixing line. So the, the role of recycling in this is something that still needs to be explored a bit more as well. Are you, are you able to use a model like the Peter Bray and Mark Pollard model um, for recycling, looking at uh, presence or absence of a number of other elements? They've been doing this with copper alloy, um, and um, uh, there's a forthcoming paper in which they show um, that if you look for uh, Roman uh, Britain, you get um, just copper and tin um, at an early stage, and then increasingly over time, uh, you get uh, alloys with extra components. Um, and the progression of this is best explained mm -hmm. by progressive recycling of simpler alloys. Can right. you do something like that? With the I've, I've already done something like that. I actually did it 10 years ago before they did their work. But it's on uh, <laughs> sub-Saharan West Africa. And, uh, and the work that I did was looking exactly that. As you see the movement of metals across the Sahara, particularly during the Islamic period, uh, you're getting these 22% brasses that are coming across quite, quite characteristically. And then immediately afterwards, they're being uh, melted down and recast. And then you see 16% brasses, and then 12% brasses, and then 6% brasses, and then 3% brasses. So I mean, you, you can see that clear progression as, as things kind of work their way down the line and through other networks, from the primary sort of consumption ports on the southern side of the Sahara uh, down into the, to the various other consumption units in, in the chain. And, and you can definitely see that pattern. I don't have the right data from North Africa. Again, that's why I need more samples. Again, most of the stuff that was analyzed was not was not analyzed by myself. And so the, the chemical side of that is something that I'm very interested in as well for, for that reason, to kind of explore, explore those questions. I was wondering if you would elaborate a little 
little bit more on, on the origin of the ores. Um, are they from places that we also have evidence <coughs> of ancient extraction, or are they based mostly uh, on geological? Yeah, the ores that have been analyzed are some of the data is published data from geological uh, work that's been done going in and characterizing these from, for, for you know, economic geology purposes. Uh, but many of the other samples are from sites with, with known ancient workings, as it were. You know, again, the, the time depth of those workings is, isn't always known. Uh, but in many of the cases, you know, there's like Roman pottery has been found, or the, you know, the little oil lamps that they use to, to do the mining, they'll find the Roman oil lamps there. So there's clear uh, Roman exploitation of some of these, but the full range of it isn't, isn't always known. So. Um, you know that that's that's another uh, side of it that I would like to, to explore further, but uh, we need, need to get on the field on that one. Um, David, can, we, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on how distinctive these northern Maghrebian and Mediterranean ore sources are from the West African and Sub-Saharan ore sources? Uh, yeah, some of the West African stuff is very different geologically. Uh, unfortunately, the problem with that, again, is that there's been very little work done on any of the West African sources. I've got some samples from Niger that I analyzed, and they're extremely radiogenic, which means that they, they, um, they were deposited with large amounts of uranium. And if you know the central uh, Niger, that is huge uh, uranium deposits, well, all the copper ores from that area have picked up, and uranium is one of the daughter products for, yeah. for the lead. So, so they're very distinctive, but there are also other uh, ore deposits as well that just haven't been characterized. But on, on current evidence, I mean, th there's no kind of overlapping distribution down there, similar to some of those Mediterranean, you know, sources. We are looking at potentially the smoking right. gun for pre-Islamic trans-Saharan trade. Right. Well, the, 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 the process of the ore uh, uh, is, and the geology is very different from the region. The African plate crashed into the to the European plate, you know, millions of years ago, and, and when it pulled away, creating the Mediterranean basin, it actually ripped off a chunk of the, of the European plate, and that represents the whole North African strip from Morocco, <coughs> Algeria, all the way to Tunisia. So the geology in those areas is actually similar, but that's just that strip. Once you move into the Sahara, yeah. it's a very different yeah. geology. Yeah, my yeah, um, question uh, for. Professor Pentrose that connects your talk back to uh, Professor Magdalene's. Um, I'm just a speculative question. I mean, to what extent, based on kind of what you've presented um, and what Professor Magdalene presented, um, do we ultimately find that the, this kind of pastoral versus sedentary divide is still a useful kind of classificatory scheme um, to talk through? Since all it seems like most of the cases that we end up talking about are are both kind of point to the fact that pastoral pastoral um, life always depended on directly or indirectly, always involved directly or indirectly, various forms of agriculture, um, various forms of market behavior, various forms of kind of close relations, um, um, both within the, um, within the oasis villages, within the mountain areas, et cetera. Um, and that, um, that really what you see, what, what both of the papers point to is a kind of these processes of, of settlement and you know, no doubt repastoralization as kind of historical kind of thing shifted. So I guess that ultimately just because we've, we've depended on these divides for so long, and they go back to David Khaldun, they go back long before, um, to what extent do you find, based on the new research that we're doing, that these just remain still useful? I mean, you know more about this in a sense than we do, because as I say, archaeologically, it's very, very difficult to pick up. Mm -hmm. And if you look at even the historical uh, Tuareg behavior, you know, as you know, there are groups that are cattle pastoralists, there are groups that are sheep pastoralists, they're, and they're quite distinct, um, but they control oases, they have people working for them. <coughs> you know, we don't know at Gadama whether it's the oasis sending out and controlling, as it were, the pastoralists, but, you know, how do you know that there aren't pastoralists controlling Gadama? Um, but the, the imbrication of the two is very complex and real. Yeah. I, no, I mean, I, I, I think absolutely. I mean, I'm not certainly trying to say there are no pastoralists right, right, and right. it's all oasis dwellers. These groups are, you know, are, are both there, but they're, they are, and they're interlinked with each other, uh, and they always have been. And, you know, the problem with the colonialist view of saying there's this pastoral, thinly occupied landscape out there. Is, is, it, is it's taken away part of that relationship. And it, and, it, and, it, and it gives a rather false impression of what those pastoral groups are up to. They are absolutely tied into these oasis communities. How do you get these goods across the Sahara uh, that we're talking about? Or how do, you, how do you get the communication between these isolated oasis communities if you don't have 
involvement with pastoral groups who are the people who know the landscape in between and have often the animals that are going to be able to make those journeys. Sure. Guy Julie produced 10,000 foals a year, according to 100,000. You're right. <laughs> uh, there's a, yeah, John. Thank you both. Uh, these are really very stimulating <coughs> papers. And I'm going to attempt a not very well formulated and probably poorly articulated question comment that really addresses both of you, I think. Uh, if I'm remembering the maps correctly, Lisa, I'm thinking first about your Gaetulian band, if you'd like, uh, stretching from Siwa all the way to the Atlantic as a significant linguistic uh, band that separated a coastal area from that, that slightly inland border. And where that band passes through what's now Tunisia, I think, Tom, didn't this not correspond right. more or less with your coastal versus inland yeah, I isotope that, I analysis? Thing, yeah. With about the same chronology as well. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering, to, to put the question to both of you in a way, is if the lead isotope analysis naturally is following the movement of goods and things, which may or may not be coincident with the movement of peoples. Uh, Lisa tracing linguistic spread uh, I, I'm un unclear whether you are claiming and wish to claim that that linguistic spread traced across from east to west also maps exactly the movement of peoples or whether it's just a cultural transmission <coughs> as in fact both could be not technically moving as much people as moving the furthest reaches of their cultural spread let's say whether it's linguistic culture or material culture and really picking up on this last question to make this even less well-formed, the idea of the distinctions between oasis communities, pastoralists, uh, is coastal, well, we've seen reason to think there's still a meaningful distinction between coastal communities and inland communities. But are we correct in thinking of that as a topographically defined distinction? Or are there other reasons why this cultural overlap, if it's significant at all, in the Roman period of language and lead isotope sources, let's say, uh, points to something else, and if so, what could that be? If we're imagining a more integrated community in that part of uh, the region. I don't have an answer, and I'm, it's really a wide open, as I said, poorly formulated question comment, but uh, any thoughts on this, on this rant? Um, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have thoughts too, but... um, uh, the one thing, The one thing that, that is interesting there is that the linguistic divide coincides with the name, the guy with, with yeah. a perceived mm -hmm. group of tribes. Right. And, um, you know, you remember the Nazionist sex guy, Julie Cordon, so right. sorry. But that you have this group of very unformed and difficult, even for the Romans to sort out what particular sorts of relationship there are between them, which is why linguistic. Um, mm -hmm suits it so nicely. Yes, I think there are both movements of people. Yes, I think that there is a continuous traffic mm -hmm. across that band from, if you like, Algila up around the shots mm -hmm. uh, through the Tower and Atlas to the Dra Valley. I think that, that we, we can see that in tomb, tomb types. We can see it in all kinds of things. Um, what was the second part? <laughs> well, um, uh, well, they're this related to the metals. No yeah, yes. find the metals. Can you put a map up, maybe, Tom? Yeah, so yeah. For people who don't know where. Because I think your language band cut right through the, uh, is it the north-south zone, the divide that Tom had? It was fine. We were trying to the map it. here. It was halfway through it. Yeah. Like that one there? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, from Bleed and the one before. Yeah, from okay. more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that map's awful impression. <coughs> I wouldn't trust it farther than I could throw. <laughs> <laughs> About the border zone. Yeah. Or, yeah. But, but actually, I mean, it's not dissimilar to my model either. In no, fact, that right. was right. the oasis zone in the desert, yeah. Uh, yeah. where, you know, we, we have this, some differences in that agricultural package and the style right. of the Indeed. settlements found that normal bit. So it's, it's, it's language and it's culture and it's... it's and is it topographically defined, though? Uh, what, what accounts for that coincidence of uh, lead isotopes, language, culture, tomb types? Well, I mean, I, you know, thinking, seeing the, seeing the talks this morning and then, of course, seeing Lisa's talk, I mean, this, this was formulating in my head as mm -hmm. these talks were going on. But, I mean, 
you know, this, this you know, connection or lack of connection between the coast and the interior over time, you know, I mean, it, it's very real in terms of what you're seeing in the isotopic patterns there. And is that simply a shift between resources or is that really just, you know, uh, controlled access to different resources yeah. by different groups? You know, are, are they not willing to share or are they moving other materials and the metals aren't moving or exactly, you know, how, how does that get interpreted? But I mean, I, I think that, you know, I hadn't really thought carefully about what that truly meant in terms of interpreting, you know, the, 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 the you know, the actual actions on the ground there, but I think, you know, based on these earlier papers and everything, I think what we're seeing is, is a real cultural, culturally driven, uh, you know, decision-making point in terms of, of, of access to resources or materials. But isn't it access to Mediterranean trade as much as anything else? That could, nobody's yeah. going to yeah. haul metals from the coast yeah. down to Kirta. Uh, but if they're moving back and forth, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not out of the question for metals to be moving on those lines as well, too. Sure. Uh, but it just may be that the, the consumption patterns on the coast aren't really allowing for the metals to go inside into the interior, and so the interior are having to provide their own. Mm -hmm. you know, and the resources are there. You know, and, that, and, and already in the early third century, uh, there's a set of separate inscriptions from all that southern reason with great tax outposts. They were taxing trade crossing from the Sahara into the coastal region, in both directions, it looks like. So the, the government knew there was some money to be made in, in regulating that trade. It, it does look like an artificial barrier in one sense, if you just took tax, uh, a tax border, if you'd like, about that period in the third century. And that's, what, that's really what I was wondering, uh, whether the Romans were exploiting an already existing divide as a natural area, or whether they were creating it. Well, this is where uh, a, a better sample of more, the more prestigious metals, such as the bronzes or something like yeah. that, would be a really useful way to look yeah. at that. Because the lead is not, obviously, a prestigious right. metal. And it's really going to be used where it's produced, kind of thing. It's not going to be moving that much. But the bronze would be, you know, and, and we saw a little bit of a different pattern with the bronze, I think, than we saw with the lead. But the sample set is so small, we can't really say much about it. So if we, if we had a larger data set, we might actually be able to, to really get that question better. Uh, um, I'm conscious of the fact that the thing standing between you and lunch is me. Uh, and so I'm going to, uh, I'm sure there are lots more questions that we could ask our presenters, but let's uh, thank them and perhaps